Oh, WWP Universe! Don't you dare be sour! Clap for your world famous 14th episode and feel the power! It's a new pod! Yes, it is! Welcome, everybody, to the 14th episode of the WWP, the World Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, Yasin Akbar Allahi, and I am here with the Daniel Bryan to my Kofi Kingston. It is Dick Skin Scott Tar. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good? Pretty you sweet. Feeling like a that track power meet. of positivity? Sweet like a track meet. Oh, yep. Gotcha, bitch. Zinger. Me, 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 me. So we're back. Uh, how have you been? I haven't been too. De- haven't been too bad. I thought you were speaking in reverse there for a second. Oh, I was. Oh, okay. Yep. It's a little Easter egg. Listen to this podcast backwards. <laughs> Listen It'll to the explain whole so thing. Much. Listen to the whole thing in reverse because we've uh, planned it out to the the word this whole podcast even that pause that i did there is all planned out so listen to this all in reverse yes yes anyways so me and dixon are actually just getting back from new york city baby actually north bergen but uh we were down there for wrestle mania just kidding we were down there for yankees games Oh, boo. Double swerve. Jeer. Boo gotcha. This, boo this man. Boo this man, I Double say. swerve. We were down there for the Ring of Honor show. <laughs> just the, on, just just the, the honor show. G1 show. Yeah. Uh, so, like I, I think I mentioned it a couple podcasts back, that I have actually been to WrestleMania before. Last year was my first time. This was your first time. How did you uh, enjoy the experience of being at WrestleMania? That was pretty fucking awesome. Yeah? It's pretty fucking great. Yeah, explain to, to people how your experience was, I guess, for, for your first Mania. It was honestly just... It was actually just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Like, from TakeOver to even G1 to access to WrestleMania itself. WrestleCon. WrestleCon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> everything Mm -hmm. um it's crazy because like even when just growing up just being a wrestling fan you feel like you're in the minority Mm -hmm. but when you go to places like this everyone there is like a wrestling fan exactly and it just it's fucking amazing like you go to to access yeah or or take over or any of the shows really yeah and you're in that crowd and you just talk with everyone because, like, you, everyone's a wrestling fan, and everyone there has a common thing of being a wrestling fan, and that's why they're there. Yeah. So you can just talk to whoever the fuck you want to talk to. Yeah. And it's not weird. It's not awkward. And it's just you guys are all experiencing and the same not thing fake. all at once. It's not fake. Not the connection that we have with those people. No. Yeah. Um. So, essentially, at, with this being your first uh, mania, your first mania weekend... Was there anything that like exceeded expectations or was less than expectations or anything like that? I did not expect Takeover to be fucking uh, the way it was. I didn't mm-hmm. expect everything ex- exceeded my expectations. That's great to hear. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, like it, I I am literally speechless from this. Mm-hmm. It's was that the best trip you've ever been on? No, that's a tough one. That's a close one, yeah. That is a close one. Because well, it wasn't he, with trips. Because it, it didn't even feel like a trip. It, it felt didn't. Like you were, it like, didn't. Yeah. Because we went th- for trips. You you go and you enjoy the city. We really didn't mm-hmm. get to see the city much. Yeah. We went for WrestleMania. Yeah. So if it's like, if I is it the best event or multiple series of events I've ever been to? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Like, I've been to Seattle a couple times, Toronto a couple times, Arizona a couple times. We've actually seen the city. We've done stuff. But at the same time, we've gone and seen baseball games, hockey games, whatever. Yeah. And, and it's been more than one. But comparing those to this, there is there is no comparison. Mm-hmm. This yeah. was so much better. Yeah, exactly. And it, it is definitely a tough comparison when it comes to an actual trip. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like you're on a trip no. when you're there because you're just in your element. You're yeah. still in your element. It's not a culture shock to go there because you're just doing wrestling shit. You're, you're not necessarily on vacation. You're not there to chill. You're there. You're still basically yourself. You're ex- on. You're on. You're still on. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Uh, For me, l- last year... 
I was in New Orleans, and this year was New York. For me personally, comparing the cities, I felt like New Orleans was the better wrestling city. Because, especially because New York is still a city. You know what I mean? Like, it's a very yeah. city-type city. Yeah. It's, it doesn't differ too far from places like Calgary, yeah. except for the fact that it's bigger and it's, like, better in its downtown area and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, those things are just elevated, but it's not different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like you're going to Cuba or you're going to Mexico or you're going to um, some fucking European country or whatever. It's still, like, a city. Yeah. And you're walking around amongst people that aren't wrestling fans and all this kind of stuff. So it didn't feel like a vacation vacation. Yeah. Because you were there and you were still in the minority when you were out and about. Yeah. Right? But last year in New Orleans, it was like very... Because this is the thing. I think the stat is that uh, the population in New Orleans is like 300,000. Okay. Or 400,000, 300,000, something like that. Very small. And then there's 100,000 people there for wrestling. Exactly. So it's like a one in four that the person you come across is going to be a wrestling fan. Yeah. And especially when you're in that downtown area, Bourbon Street, uh, Canal Street area, everyone there was like wrestling fans essentially. Yeah. Where this year in New York, in New York, New York, in New York, there's 8 million people in New York. Yeah. And there's still like 100,000 people for wrestling. But that's still... So now it's like a 1 in 8,000 ratio yeah. to last year's 1 in 4. Yeah. So that was the only difference really is that going there, like the actual city itself, New Orleans bested New York for me. Yeah. However, I would argue, and we'll get more into it later on, but I would argue that New York's shows were better than New Orleans' shows, which is a very heavy comparison to make because both years were actually quite quality, to be honest. Yeah. So it's tough. But I would argue that New York's shows this year all across the board maybe have bested New Orleans' shows. Yeah. However, we will get to that in due time uh, of all that. Before I started this uh, podcast, though, this is uh, Dixon isn't too familiar with this, but I wanted to start off this podcast by dedicating this podcast to the late, great Nipsey Hussle, who uh, passed away since the last time we passed away is a very nice way of putting it. Uh, He was killed, obviously, uh, since we recorded the last podcast. So I wanted to put that out there into the, the universe. Uh, he may be gone, but he'll never be forgotten. Uh, the impact that he did have was larger than music because uh, a lot of people, and this is the thing, is that I was never the biggest Nipsey Hustle fan in terms of music because it's just it was like gangster rap type music that I just wasn't into because, yeah, it's just a genre that I'm not fully immersed in and fully into because I like... Uh, just a different style because it yeah. it wasn't it wasn't my style of music. Yeah. However, that I don't even think that that's what Nipsey Hussle was known for, regardless, because that's not even how I knew him. Because he was a very big role in the the evolution of the community that he was in and trying to build up uh, people that were in these oppressed positions and trying to give them the voice. That they needed that they do not have. He was the voice of the voiceless. Essentially. Because he, from from a perspective, and this is something that uh, I've kind of learned over the last probably three or four years, is that the only way for people in oppression to, to get change for them is that it has to come from someone outside of the glass. Someone looking into the looking glass is the only person that can help them out. Yeah. Because they themselves can't, do anything from where they're in because there's a reason that they are being oppressed, right? Because they put them in these uh, scenarios to where these people can't actually physically fight back or rebel in their situations because they don't have the tools to do so. Yeah. So someone who is outside of this looking glass of, outside of this fishbowl of uh, the oppression is the only people that can make the change for it. And the people that 
are doing that that are that are huge and I have have put in a huge amount of effort for that is Jay Z and Nipsey Hussle. And Nipsey Hussle is now gone. And it's just, especially because it was off some bullshit. It's really sad. So I think that he will go down in history and with his legacy, it won't be music. No. It'll be the legacy that he leaves behind of unity and um equality and, and all that kind of stuff. And more stuff on a on a societal level, stuff that's bigger than music and entertainment. Fair enough. So yeah, just wanted to dedicate this episode to uh, Nipsey Hussle, the great. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So. Also, shout out to Snickers, by the way. <laughs> you're fucking dick. Yeah. Yeah, in this situation is when you want to take the piss. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's move forward. Um, so, before we uh, start talking about wrestling again, we should talk about uh, the Kevin Hart Irresponsible comedy special yeah what were your thoughts because we both just watched it uh for the first time so what was your thoughts on uh the comedy special i i thought it was really funny like it's hard to for uh, for stand-up it's hard for kevin hart to disappoint but it wasn't one of his better comedy specials yeah it's we've talked about it's probably his weakest yeah i would argue i would actually argue that this was not a good Really? Stand up special. Which is harsh to say. It's harsh to say. And it's and it's also who am I to say that? Yeah. Because I'm not a stand up fucking genius. Yeah. Right? Like but looking at the special itself, I think that there's maybe like two or three jokes that I can pick out of the special and tell you happened. Okay. Because I don't find it to be a very memorable special in terms of the jokes itself, yeah, and the the comedy, br- the brunt of the comedy that was uh, being passed through. Now, Kevin is a very funny comic, and I don't. Before we start talking about this, I don't want to take anything away from Kevin Hart. No, because he is hilarious. He is, in my opinion, one of the greatest stand-up comics that will ever touch the stage because of. The, the the heights that he reached with it, right? With his comedy. Yeah. So with that being said, I think that this special really showed where Kevin Hart is and what where his perspective is and that you can kind of see that stand-up isn't the priority anymore. Yeah. Which isn't a bad thing by no. any means. I'm not saying that like, stand-up needs to be the, the priority. I'm not saying that. But I think that this is kind of like it's the shifting of the guard from before he was a stand-up act. Yeah. And I'm not going to take that away from him. He was stand-up through and through. And that's why he put out like great special after great special after great special. Yeah. This special had me die and laughing at some parts, particularly one part. Yeah. But the actual overall nature of the special it kind of showed where he's lacking now in comparison to what he would have been lacking like before. Yeah. Because now he's clearly more comfortable on stage, but also his comedy has veered into a direction that is kind of... Like, it it seems, to me, it seems a bit disingenuine. Yeah. If that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Because it's like, like for example, and again, spoilers, by the way, for anyone that's uh, listening to this that hasn't seen the special. If you want to go watch the special, go watch and then come back. Yes. But, uh, or skip ahead to, to whenever. We'll probably put the link down. In maybe. The, maybe. Maybe. If it's uh, not, then you're, you're going to have to take a risk. Yeah. If you want to keep listening. If, if not, if it's not in the description, just go watch it first and come back. Or if you don't care, just keep listening. So, uh, where was I? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Disingenuine. Yeah. Kevin has a joke in the special about uh, the new baby, right? Where he's like, like, the talking, great baby. No, not the great baby. The new baby. Oh, that he his has. new His new baby. Yeah, okay, and it's yeah. like being the fun dad is like hard. Yeah. Because like when the baby like is there and you've come home and now you're tired and like this is that. Yeah. But Kevin was talking about like, oh, like every single person has done this in here. When you're coming home from work and like, you get in the door and the baby's there like super like, oh my God, like like it's time for fun, dad. And it's like, 
we know from an outside perspective, we know that that isn't who Kevin is anymore. No. Because he's bigger than that now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's something that I saw actually in a, uh, a, a, a YouTube video. I can't remember for the life of me who it's by or, or what it's called. I think it's called How Dave Chappelle Dodges the Laser Beams. Okay. I think that's what it's called. And in that, in that video, they talk about Kevin Hart. Yeah. And they talk about the, the comedy laser beams that Dave Chappelle avoids. And it's that one of the biggest things about stand-up comedy is relatability to yeah. an extent, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, when you hear – and I, that, that, it was that. And it was like Kevin Hart in his specials talks about shit that's super relatable to me yeah. and you. Even though we know – that that is probably not the case because yeah. he doesn't live our everyday lives no, he doesn't. because he's way past that. And more power to him. I'm not saying that he shouldn't or that he's in a place where he shouldn't do that. Let's switch lives, Kevin. One like, day. Like, you know what I mean? Live though? my life. But you know what I mean, though? Yeah. Like, I'm not saying that, no. oh, you're too big to be doing stand-up. No. It's just that stand-up, you, some people use that as a tool or like a crutch to rest on. Yeah. The relatability aspect. Yeah. But we know that it's not relatable anymore. Yeah. Right? Where Dave Chappelle does not do that. Yeah. Because Dave Chappelle kind of tackles it head on that he's a big deal. Yeah. And that, like, he is a famous person that we aren't in the same shoes. Yeah. But he breaks it down into every little emotion and human perspective, which is what makes it relatable. Yeah. Where Kevin li literally gives you scenarios that are relatable. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's... Another issue that I think I kind of have with it is that I can kind of see through all the the relatable BS for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Um, and I see what you're saying. I, I, I get it. I agree with it. And you're right. It, it, it's not his focus. I think one of the biggest issues is that so many of these comics that we see pop up onto Netflix – Mm -hmm. They are signed for like a seven special deal with Netflix or a five special deal with Netflix. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah. Like um, Amy Schumer. I think so. I think Jim Jeffries has a five special deal and he's done three already. Chappelle what? did four. Yeah. And well, does does Chappelle count as four or is it two specials with two episodes in them? I don't know. Yeah. But but that, but the thing about it is um, with that, they're always going to need to come up with new material, new that. And like you said, Kevin's focus isn't on his stand-up anymore. And that's another thing that I, I was going to uh, briefly uh, bring up. Yeah. Is that Kevin is in such a different space to any other comedian on the planet right now. Yeah. Because Kevin Hart isn't just stand-up now. He is a bona fide A-list movie star. Yep. Like starring role. Like he has like... He probably has like 10 plus starring roles every year for the last three, four years, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Like last year, he had so many fucking movies. What do you have? Uh, like he, Night School was one. Night School. Uh, there's more. I'm not going to go through all of them. I can't <laughs> remember. Night School and more. I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Juman was Jumanji last year or was that yeah, two years ago? That, I think doesn't matter. That was last year. That doesn't, was last year. Doesn't matter. Yeah. The thing about it is that as a movie star, he's looked at in a different lens than any other comic. Yeah. Because cause he's a movie star. Exactly. And he's big and he's fucking yeah. huge. And he's an influencer now as opposed yeah. to just a comic. Yeah. And when he makes offensive jokes, if he takes it too far or even a smidge over that line, yeah. people will destroy him. Yep. So now he, as a comic has to make the most broad comic he, comedy he can make yeah. to attract every single side of society because that's where his eyes are. Yeah. His eyes are no longer a niche market. Like Jim Jeffries, yeah. for example, has a very niche market. Yeah. Right? Like Here, I would say it's probably like, you I know, was 18, bring this up too. 18 to 35 year olds who like the word cunt. <laughs> That's Jim Jeffries' like niche target audience. Mainly men. Mainly males. Mainly white males. Mainly white drunks. Yeah. It's like and those kind of like guys. I was going to bring this up because... Like the pub, the pub crowd exactly. is Jim Jeffries' crowd. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I was going to bring this up that Jim Jeffries wasn't a very well-known comedian until his gun control bit. Yeah. And that is probably one of his funniest bits. Hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. Because of the related, it, it related to one of the most important uh, topics in society, society yeah. at the time, yeah. even today. And that's why it's probably one, it's probably his best bit. And that was in his first Netflix special. In his second Netflix special. Oh, that was on a Netflix special. I didn't know that. Yeah, Bear was. In, I thought I thought it was a Comedy Central special. I'm pretty sure Bear was Netflix. Okay. I, I could be wrong. I'll check. He, I think he did that bit in different uh, stand-ups before, but yeah. hit, I think it's known for Bear, which is a Netflix special. Okay. And then in his Netfl- in his next Netflix special, Freedom, um, he starts off with a very, very crude joke about Bill Cosby. And this was at the time. <laughs> yeah, that was lit. <laughs> when Bill Cosby was being convicted. And he finished it off by saying that he got nasty reviews from Australia when he did the bit. And then he did another joke. And then he talked about how he was under a lot of fire because his last bit in his last special, the Bear special, he told a lot of misogynistic jokes. And the thing about it is you never hear any of this in his other specials before this. Because he wasn't well known. He wasn't well known. But after the... Gun control. gun control he became well known as a comedian and now people are looking at him yeah in a different scope exactly exactly they view him as the political by the way, comedian by the way uh bear is a netflix special yeah yeah and that's and but when he told the bill cosby bit at the end of it he said uh australia some r- newspaper in australia gave me a nasty review saying that it's my belief that women should be happy when they're drugged and raped and he's like <laughs> And, and then he's like, not my opinion. It's a joke I made. There's a difference between things I think and things I think are funny to say. Yeah. And it's like, and here's the thing about he's right that once people reach that level, Kevin Hart's on a higher, way higher level than Jim Jeffries with way so higher, many exactly. more. But since he got But when you that, have the eyes of the world on you, you have the eyes of a market that you're not trying to reach. Yeah. And those people are the ones that will get offended by your jokes. Exactly. But the people that are your niche market yeah. will not care that much. And they'll be like, well, this is what he's always done. Yeah, and that's the but thing. But Kevin like, can't do that, though. No. Because Jim is still within his niche a little bit. But, the, but Kevin's niche, because this is the thing. Yeah. Jim Jeffries' crowd, his niche still outweighs the eyes that have seen him. And that's, yes. The eyes that are on him, the niche market still outweighs the eyes that are on him. Yeah. Where Kevin Hart, the eyes that are on him now outweighs his niche market. Yeah. So he can't just cater to, he can't cater to the niche market anymore where Jim Jeffries can. Yeah. He can no longer cater to that niche market. He has to cater to the entire fucking media now. Yeah. And that's a big issue when it comes to stand up. Yeah. If Jim Jeffries had his third special, This Is Me Now on Netflix, and that is by far the worst of the three, I think it's funny. I, I haven't thi- seen it. I think it's around the same as Kevin's latest special, where, again, it's his weakest. Some will view it as bad. Some will view it as funny. I think it's funny, but it's definitely his worst. If you're not too picky with it, it's good. And the thing about it is, he does tone it down a lot. Yeah. He. And and by Jim Jeffrey scale, he's still crude. He's still he's still trying to reach out to that uh, niche. niche. His but he's also see- seeing that in freedom he talked about this, but he basically gave the message it's like, I'm telling jokes up here. I don't actually believe the stuff I'm saying. I just know my crowd thinks it's funny. There's people who think it's funny. Some of the people who came in because of the gun control bit will think it's funny. There's going to be people who don't think it's funny, but I'm not trying to appeal to them. Yeah. They're not my crowd I'm trying to appeal to. Yeah. And he basically says that. So freedom, he still gives his crude comedy bit, but a lot of people still view Bear. I view Bear as his better one, but a lot of people view Bear as a lot better because the people who came in for freedom were expecting that political satire, but got Jim Jeffries. Yeah. So they kind of view it as, that, oh, it's much more crude. It wasn't as good. So in This Is Me Now, he toned down the crudeness, but he, he did the politicalness. He didn't, though, oh. he, because like he's not a political comedian. Yeah. He had that one bit. Yeah. And that was basically it. And it was a great bit. But in This Is Me Now, he still tried to tell his Jim Jeffries jokes, but he, could, he wasn't as crude as he could have been. 
Yeah, because even that's the like it's even because it. even in freedom, uh, we're gonna get off this topic in a bit here. But yeah. but even in freedom, he does politic it up a bit. Yeah, with like uh, he has like the abortion joke and stuff like that. Like the uh, the, the one uh, where it's like you know if. Oh, the uh, abortion and gun laws. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's two topics where there's you're either pro gun laws and anti-abortion, and or, or pro abortion and anti gun yeah. laws. So there's that, right? <laughs> they're talking about these two topics, and while they're talking, about don't tell the joke. Focus, don't tell the joke. They're shoving don't tell other the things up the ass. Don't tell the joke. <laughs> no, I just love that Anyways. part. They're shoving you up the ass with other things. I like yeah. fucking. Anyways, and it's crude. It works. But, uh, anyways, besides that, yeah, sorry. Uh, what was I even talking about? Um. Yeah, he still had a little of the political satire right. in it. So he still he still did that because he knew what was coming in, and he still had to cater to that niche, right? Yeah. So he catered to both sides. Yeah. Where I I haven't seen this as me now, and it sounds like he kind of just abandoned ship and just kind of <laughs> went back to bare bones comedy. His his best, which was what irresponsible was for uh, Kevin Hart. There's only one part I remember from This Is Me Now and it's when he's at Warren Buffett's birthday party. I won't tell the bit. Watch yeah. it. I think it's really funny. Yeah. But... So, yeah. Yeah. But regardless, uh, I just... Uh, going back to the Irresponsible uh, uh, movie special. Yeah. I just think that with Kevin's status, he cannot physically go and be the Kevin Hart we want. Because Kevin Hart was never even really that crude. No, he never he was. He wasn't. He was not a, an offensive comic, like even at all. Like he just, really, he had edge. He had like a bit of an edge, though. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And then now, this was another thing that really bugged me about the special, actually, and it was a big thing that I noticed. It was the cuts. Okay. The cuts, I fucking hate it. Yeah. I hate it because because it was very obvious that they did two specials. And they merged them together and oh, got the yeah. best of the best of each one. I didn't even notice that. Oh, I noticed it, and it fucking it was hurting my head. And it's just not raw. No, like, and I don't like that about comedy. I want a comedy special to be raw in its essence. Yeah, like look at Delirious. Look yes. at look at Bear. Look at uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, specials. Like, yeah, look at these specials where it's like very authentic. To yeah. what's going on? Where this one wasn't that authentic, because no. you could see, you could hear the lack of flow in it, because you could, because he was doing two different specials at the same time. Yeah, and that was that was an issue that I just had with it. It was like, like I couldn't watch it, knowing that it's like I'm not having a conversation with you. I'm watching two different sides of something that you did. And it's like just trying to make yourself look the best possible instead of it being raw in its essence. And like, you know, it cuts to the crowd and it shows like a crowd member laughing. It cuts back to him. It's like, let me just see what's happening. It's like in wrestling where they do that, where a, a big move will happen. Remember yeah. back in the day? And then they'll show a replay of like a fan like losing his mind in the crowd while surrounded by fucking nine people who aren't losing their mind in the crowd. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, well, that just took me out of it a bit. Yeah. That's what this, that's what it was doing in this special. Yeah. And it just it just really really irked me, like, and that was that was just one big thing in that special that was just like so off putting to me because I just want to see raw in its essence the special. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I don't mind camera cuts, no. like cutting from one angle to another angle. I don't mind that. Yeah, but when it's cutting between two different things, yeah, it just takes me out of it. You know, because you're telling a story up there. Yeah. And I'm hearing two versions of the story told the exact same way, but in different cadences. Yeah. And it ruins the flow. Yeah, it does. Like, for example, the joke where, uh, the oh, shit, you want to rob me and whatever. And then, like, he's, like, dying laughing on the last one, right? Yeah. And then it cuts away, and then it comes back, and he's fine. He's, like, perfectly fine. Yeah. Right? And he just continues. And it's, like... That just took me way out of like the the hysterics that I was just in. Exactly, it's not gradual, so yeah, that was like a a big issue that I I had with that. But again, shout out to Kevin Hart though, like he did a good job, and uh, he did good for what he can possibly do at this point. Yeah, because like look at the Oscars thing where you know he told a gay joke six years ago, and then everyone was like, oh, he's a fucking homophobe. Now we don't want him to host the Oscars, and he didn't host the Oscars. And, and, and that's the risk he runs. And I, I kind of just, I thought of this too, because of the, the 
contracts they have with Netflix where you have to do this amount of specials. Mm -hmm. And it's for this one with Kevin Hart and uh, this is me now with Jim Jeffries. They're trying to be more relatable to the pe to their, his critics because yeah. Netflix is being like, you have a lot of heat coming down on you now. You need to diffuse this heat. So Maybe. Kevin Hart gives a little, a bit uh, special mm -hmm. that's not as edgy as his other Maybe. ones. And Maybe. it's the same with Jim Jeffries. And I think it's just to show that they, and I don't get why it would be Jim Jeffries because they, when they signed him, they You should knew, know what you're getting into. Exactly. But, but it's the thing It's like, of, you know, Kevin Hart, yeah. Kevin Hart got in trouble for the, the mom joke. The mom joke? Like, the, like the mom, there's one thing that you're not that's fun. Oh, like yeah. There's no such thing as a fun mom and this is that. Like, he got in trouble for that. That's bullshit. Not, not in the special, but he told it before. Yeah. He told it on SNL in oh, his opening yeah. monologue, and everyone lost their fucking minds. Like, what? I'm fun. I'm a fun mom. And it's like, by saying you're the fun mom, you're not the fun mom. How cool was that? It's like, oh, you know what I mean? It's like, the moms that'll get upset that you said I'm not a cool mom are the moms that are actually just not cool. You're yeah, not exactly. cool. You've just proven his point that you're not actually cool. Like, if you have a cool mom, your kid will never say, yeah, my mom's cool. They'll say, she, she's pretty cool. She's okay. And then the mom will no, never have that, a response to it. Well, obviously, everyone, everyone like, yeah. loves their mom. Yeah. Like, as long as their mom's, like, a good mom. Yeah. But, you know... It was a joke. It's exactly. obviously a joke, and he's painting it with a broad brush to be relatable. And Jim Jeffries also touches on this. That's what people don't get. There's Kevin Hart, the person. There's Jim Jeffries, the person. Then there's Kevin Hart, the comedian. Yeah. Jim Jeffries, the comedian. Two completely different people. Exactly. It's like when Kevin Hart starts acting in a movie, you don't be like, why would Kevin Hart do that? It's why would this character do that? And it keeps you in the movie. And that's the issue with stand-up comedy in a sense is people that people can't separate the it's comic. hard to separate the comic from the person exactly and then you like you see instances with like people like robin williams and what happened to him yeah and it's like oh wow they're actually two very different people yeah it's like you know what i mean so yeah it's it's a, a bit of like a situation that a comic has to go through to get to but i think Putting yourself in that relatable category in your comedy yeah. kind of opens yourself up for that in a way, though. Yeah. And that's, like, that's just an issue that, that they have to face to yep. an extent. So it's, you know, like, it, it's just something that if they figure it out, like, the, the key to it, the key to it really is evolving with your status in your comedy. Yeah. And that's something that Dave Chappelle has mastered to me. Yeah. And it's the reason that I think that Dave Chappelle is the greatest comic out right now. Yeah. Is because he's mastered the idea of, like, I'm not relatable to you guys anymore, but I can break this down on a human sense, and that's where the relatability comes from. Okay, It yeah. doesn't need to come from my status. Yeah. I don't need to be talking about, oh, I was with my kids the other day, and I did this, and I did... It's like, he's just like... I am I am a bigger star than this, but if you break it down to human emotion, yeah, human emotion is still human emotion. Exactly. And at the end of the day, we're all people. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. Anyways, uh, we've been on this topic for far too long at this point. Yeah. But uh, just just to kind of end it off, mm -hmm. it's these guys. You see, you see that they have these week specials, and it's because in in mainly. It could be today or it just could be in society in general. Once you have so many eyes watching you, you have to start watching yourself. But exactly. Like once this podcast blows up, you will never hear Dixon say the word cunt. No. No, not at all. <laughs> once, this, once this podcast blows up, I will probably be fired from the podcast. It'll probably just be me. Yeah. Like it'll be you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, WWP Podcast, I'm Yasin. And here as always is... Jonathan <laughs> Russo. It's like, what? Who the Jonathan fuck is it? Russo? I don't know. Some random name. Weird. This is like, where's Dixon? Dixon, unfortunately, was fired for his past instances on the podcast. Oh, you mean being Dixon? Yeah. Yeah. He kind of yeah, had to go. Because Dixon on the podcast and Dixon the person are the same person. Essentially. They for are. For the most part. They are. Yeah. Because I don't have a character. Yeah. I'm a little bored. But 
to be fair, it's just us bullshitting at this point. But honestly, anyways, it, yeah, let's move on. Uh, we're gonna move forward with this. Let's now finally get into wrestling and the whole wrestling week. See what we're doing? We're ending off at wrestling, but we started at wrestling. See, you got to start at the end and work your way back and work your way all the way back to the end. That's the best way to tell a story. Exactly. Yeah, so that's there what we we're go. doing right now. Uh, let's start with, I guess, I guess WrestleMania weekend. And just as a broad, let, let's do a broad overview of how do you think the whole weekend went in I, terms of wrestling. In term, I think it went great. Mm -hmm. Takeover. Stole the weekend as usual. Well, we were going to get there, but I guess we'll, well start there now. Okay, well, what do you mean like as a broad? I just wanted a broad overview of how you thought the wrestling this weekend was. I think it was great. Like That, that it, well, okay. You, you can't, really, you can't really say a broad thing without going into the specifics. You don't have to specifically go into specifics, but you have to at least break it down into minor parts. All right, I'll do it. You do so, it. So, I think as, a, as an overall weekend, I thought that this weekend was really strong. In comparison to previous years, I felt like uh, the the action as well this year. Well, we were going to get into the action. I haven't gotten uh, what? No, I'm saying the action as well this year. I feel like the the way that that they also this is a big thing of, about this weekend that I thought was really strong is just the pacing yeah. of all the shows. Yeah, just seemed to be really concise. And they really flushed it out properly this year. Yeah. Where last year it was all over the place. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to to basically start there where it's this year was just strong in general. Yeah. Like, and I don't think that there was any weak points really. There. Yeah. Like I don't think so. There, and we'll get into to more specifics. specifics. And there, there, there's obviously some weak spots, but I mean weak points in the whole bigger that's a, Like picture. these weak spots are made up by really strong spots. Yeah. So, so let's get into it. I want to start actually at the G1 show. Okay, yeah. I want to start there. So uh, Ring of Honor G1 Supercard from the Garden. Uh, what did you think of the event? Um... It's kind of hard to explain. I liked it. But the thing is that you're not in, immersed in exactly. the Exactly. To me, is probably the weakest part of the weekend <laughs> because I'm not... You're well, right. I let's, don't... Let's, all, let's also preface this that we didn't go to Joey Ryan's uh, penis party. No. We, didn't, we weren't there. Sorry, guys. The only three shows we were at was TakeOver, the G1 show, and Mania. And that's yeah. the only shows that either of us have seen in full. Yeah. Yeah. Did you watch... No, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. But with G1... I. I liked how they, they they did it like a pay-per-view should be. They start off strong, and then from there, they built off. They they went kind of back down a bit, but built up to the end. Like, it was a it was up here, then, then it came down a bit, but then it was a higher rise. To you know what? Higher. I'll actually argue I don't think that that was intentional. Really? I think it was in a bit of a way where with the time they gave everything. Yeah. Because the time just gradually got longer and longer and longer That's and longer true. in the matches, which yeah. which was building. But <clears throat> with the G1 show, I want to put this down. I want to put a mark down right here. Just a dagger. Just stop. Let's stop right here. The Wrestling Observer Awards came out this year. Okay. Right? Or uh, in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And... The worst match of last year, according to the Mr. The, Meltzer, um, the awards was the tag team match between DX and the Brothers of Destruction at Crown Jewel. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. So this is the the dagger I want to put right here. Yeah, that fucking women's match was worse than that tag team match. Hundred percent by a mile and a half. Yeah, if that match. Is not on that fucking worst wrestling match of the year at the end of the year. I'm going to be furious unless the other matches that I see are actually worse. If I see ten more matches that are actually worse than that, yeah, sure, exactly. But, but that was a terrible match. Yeah, it was really bad. Yeah, but the thing is that it wasn't in WWE. No. So I'm curious to see, does that... Sh but it was on one of the biggest shows of the year, though. Yeah. So I want to see, how does that hold up at the end of the year? Will people just let it brush aside? 
or will they be like, okay, this was actually really bad? I thought you were going to get into a different part of the G1 where, like, you talk, you're you starting with Crown Jewel, where it was the tag team DX vs. Brothers oh, of Destruction. Oh, we're going to get there, too. Four part-timers, and people are always oh. complaining. These guys should just retire. They're not as good as they used to be. They're ruining their legacy. The fucking rumble at the, the G1. Great Muda. But that's a bit different, because it, it's a rumble. Exactly. It's a rumble, so it's a bit different. It is a bit like, different. Like, you know, you, you get the pops in rumbles, too, like yeah. where Rowdy Roddy Piper comes out or whoever. Not anymore, obviously. But the but thing is, when you have the guys behind us saying, they're just as good as they were, it's like, well, that's just not true. Yeah, they're like talking about like, whoa, Muda's really moving around that ring. I'm like, well, he's not. <laughs> he's really not. Liger's a completely different story because Liger's still great. Yeah. But the great Muda... Who was who was once upon a time the best wrestler on the planet is not the same guy he was then because he's probably like I'm gonna check how old is the great Muta let's see uh, the know. great Muta and, and yeah uh where is it I'll talk a bit he's okay. 56 years old yeah that's okay he's 56 years old. And he's not the same guy he was. And that's not his fault. Nope. That's not a bad thing. But when you're going to give that the it's it's due of like, whoa, he's the he's just the s No. 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 Shawn Michaels did infinitely better oh, than yeah. the great mood it did in that battle hey, royal. Twenty seventeen Royal Rumble when Tager came at what, number twenty eight or twenty nine? Uh twenty nine. Great moment. He he just gets in the ring right away, stares down Goldberg. He's looking amazing with the long yep. hair and the black hair and the black goatee back. And then he starts wrestling, and people are saying, wow, he's really showing his age. He he, he, can't he did do great it. in the Rumble. He did great. He did great. But people said, he's really showing his age. He's showing he can't do it anymore. This WrestleMania should be his last. And they're saying that, but... When Muda goes into the Rumble at G1, oh my God, he's just as good as he used to be. He's not. He's just not. So I haven't seen him wrestle, but again, I could tell he's not. Again, no disrespect to Muda. No. One of the greatest ever. But Good for him to give the people that pop. And it's not about him. Moment. This isn't about him. No, it's, it's not. It's not about Muda. It's about the fan base. Yeah. And how we dismiss certain things and not other things. Yeah. Where it's like we either dismiss it all or we... Embrace it all. Yeah. For me, I would like to embrace it all. Yeah. That's my thing. If I, because I want to embrace Muda the same way I want to embrace Taker, the same way I want to embrace Triple H or Kane or The Big Show, even or Batista Shawn Michaels, Batista, like any of these people. I I want to embrace all of them. Sting when he came back. Yeah. I want to embrace it all. Yeah. But if you are going to reject one part, reject everything. Yep. Don't. Half ass it because one of them is WWE and they don't know what the people want. But then because this is New Japan and Ring of Honor and all this kind of shit, it's like, okay, we'll let that slide because these guys never got their due on a bigger stage. Look at Bully Ray too. Like he he's he's still working great. No, he, Billy, Bully Ray could still go. No, no, that's not even what, a sl step slower. No, no, but in the match he had, he's not doing the things he used to do because of his age. Like what? Was he jumping off the top rope? Was he doing power bombs through tables? He was did do a power bomb through a table. He power bombed a guy through a table, but he didn't he do, didn't the, do full, the sit out. The sit out. Yeah, he he he's not doing the moves he used to because of his age. Okay, I'm not I saying he's it. bad. I'm not. Yeah, he's yeah, still yeah. doing great. Yeah, I know. But I know he that. is definitely one step slower than he used to be. Well, yeah, arguably, yeah. But that's the thing when you got wrestlers like wrestlers who are, I guess, older. Who are let's say a step slower than he used to be? Triple H is still doing great. Batista yep. showed that he's still doing great. When yep. Sean came back, he showed he's still doing great. Taker, he's still the best wrestler on the planet. Taker has <laughs> Taker has shown that he's had WrestleMania 33 was a tough time. Came back at 34, 34 showed he was in great shape. Yep. Uh, I believe he he did great at uh, Super, Super Showdown. Showdown. I believe. Again, he was a step slower than Super Showdown at Crown Jewel, but I still do, do believe he did pretty good. It's just so many things went wrong in that match. Yeah. But it's still the same thing that they reject part of the story. Yeah. But choose to accept the, the next part. Yeah. It's like so they're also at the G1 Super Show. Let's talk about probably the biggest part of the night. 
and it's not Switchblade, it's not Okada, it's not Naito, and it's not Ibushi, and it's not the ladder match. It's fucking Enzo and Cass. Let's talk about this. Who would have thought? So, the tag team Fatal 4-Way survival, survival match was going on with uh, G.O.D., um, the, the Briscoes, the Villain Enterprises, and uh, PCO and... Um, uh, I can't remember the name. Guy. Whatever. Whatever. I can't I remember. Know. That's PCO. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, after the match... G.O.D. won. G.O.D. won. Congratulations to them. Yep. After the match, you we were in the crowd, right? And we see water go flying at the briefcase, or beer go flying at the br- at the briefcase, the barricade, the, the barricade, and the Briscoes like get it hit in the face with it, and they just start fucking throwing. Yeah. And then you see, I'm like, what the fuck is going on down there? And then you see this blonde hair short guy dive over the fucking barricade into the Briscoes, <laughs> and I'm like, what? No. <laughs> Is that Enzo? And everyone, and everyone around me is like, no, nah, it can't be Enzo. It can't be Enzo. Then you look closer. It's, it's fucking, fucking Enzo. Enzo. No way. And they just start scrapping. <laughs> Bully Ray comes sprinting from the yeah. back. Starts fucking stiffing them. Like Bully destroying them. Bully Ray comes them. down just proving everything that I just said wrong. Yep. <laughs> yep. And he just fucking throws. He starts killing them. He kills them. And then we see this guy... Who's seven foot tall. And you can't teach that. Come in. And he starts fucking mucking guys. Yeah. Just killing them. Yep. He got one of the Briscoes, I think, full headlock, wrenching him back. Like it's yep. not like it's not like one of those like kind of a rest headlocks yep. you see. Full arm underneath the chin, pulling Just back, pulling strangling back. guy. Bully Ray comes beat the shit out of him. Enzo comes in to help. Bully Ray grabs Enzo, whips him. Face first yep. into the fucking barricade. It was so sick. So now with this, it was there was a big question: Is it a work? Is it a shoot? They didn't show it on the cameras. Yeah, and all this kind of stuff. I turns out it's a fucking work. Yep, and it was a work of pure art. Yes, it was brilliant. Here's the thing: It's either a work of pure art or. They it's just the forgot. Worst thing ever. No, or they forgot to tell some of the guys that it was going down. Well, that's it. I, it's that there was a conversation between Ring of Honor and New Japan, and New Japan didn't want it on the show, but Ring of Honor did. Yeah. So Ring of Honor brought them in, and New Japan was was trying not to shoot it because they were the ones in, in control of the, okay, yeah. the cameras. Yeah. So they just were like straying away from it, and then Enzo and Cass and Bully Ray and the Briscoes are doing all this great work off camera. Yeah. So it's like. But it made it better. It made it more it real. It did. And it, 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 like, it was completely unintentional for how good it was. Yeah. But it was great. And uh, oh I, can't re- I really can't wait to see what Enzo and Cass do because I'm a huge fan of Enzo and Cass. Yeah. I'm a really big fan of them. Obviously, Enzo's a bit of a fucking retard when it yeah. comes to certain things like Survivor Series when he uh, stood up and tried to like <coughs> get the whole crowd to chant his name and all this kind of shit. Yeah. Like he's a bit of a fucking idiot there. Yeah. But overall, like on – Television, when he's booked to be on television, he's a genius. I love it. He's brilliant. Yeah. So I love Enzo and Cass, and I'm quite excited to see what they're gonna do next. Yeah. Um. Let's go to the the two matches on the card that I think are the most notable, probably the Naito Ibushi match and uh, Switchblade and Okada. Naito so, Ibushi was just brutal. They were just killing each other, which it, I love. I don't think it was as good as their matches previously. You, you've for showed me. me like at least highlights of their matches previously, and yeah. the highlights from that match don't compare. Yeah, they're, they're I, great. It's great. It's still a great it's match. Brutal. Still a great match. But I just don't think it was as good. No, it was still it was still good though. Yeah, but uh, I thought that it, it told a great story at least. Yeah, uh, Naito uh, is one of the most charismatic people on the planet in terms of wrestling. Oh, that was so amazing. he he killed it. And uh, Ibushi also killed it with, like, his storytelling. Yeah. Ibushi also won his first uh, IWGP Intercontinental Championship at this show, which was awesome. Fully deserved. It's a long time coming. So I'm glad to see he has that belt. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about Switchblade and uh, Okada, the main event. I thought that match was really good. Mm-hmm. But, uh, what else? Um, it, it, It's hard to pick points out because... 
with a lot of matches, you try and focus on the moves and how they relate to the story. I didn't really know the story going into the match, but besides that, to me, it started out slow. It was a good rise to the match. Um, but it was better than I expected a Ring of Honor match to be. It wasn't a Ring of Honor match. It was match. a New Japan match. New Japan match. match. Uh, it, because, like, here's the thing. People talk about these matches, how they're the greatest matches you ever see. And it's kind of that mentality that people say, well, fit, people saying it's the greatest. It's not the greatest. Like, I'll leave that yeah. to Joe. It's like when you build something up so much and then you actually watch it, it's like, okay, it's not the greatest. And I've done that. People build New Japan matches up to be the greatest, and I've watched a couple New Japan matches. I'm like, okay, well, they're not the greatest. Yeah. So I kind of expected this match to just be okay because that was my mindset going into it. Yeah. Exceed my expectations. That's good. I thought it was really good. It built it built really well. Yeah. And uh, I thought in terms of a New Japan main event, I thought it was a very run-of-the-mill okay. uh, New Japan main event. I didn't think it was... Like anything special from any New Japan main event. Yeah. And even on a WWE standard, I don't think that it was like amazing, 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 amazing. It was it was a great match. Yep. It was a great match. It's a steal the show type match. Yeah. Right? But it's not a steal the year type match. No. It's not a steal the decade type match. It would but that doesn't take anything away from it. Yeah. I'm just pointing out a a a, a point. Yeah. But Okada and, and JY put, told a really good story. They put it together really well. Also, the story leading up to it with Okada uh, losing the title to Omega, Omega and then falling down the card and then like going on a really big like defeat streak and like losing a lot and then building his way all the way back up to this moment to finally get his chance again, and he wins was really great. It, it was a great, uh, a well told story and a well thought out story. Thing is, though, is that. Uh, I'm curious with where New Japan is going to go now. Because they with, lost a lot of their big stars. With the elite leaving, yeah, it's kind of left them in a really shitty position. They still have great talent. They still have Naito, Ibushi, yeah. uh, Okada, Jay White, the rest of the Bullet Club, Tama Tonga and all that. Yeah. Um, they still They still have great talent. Yeah. They still have Suzuki and Ishii and all that. But I again, I am curious as to where they go now. Because I feel like they shouldn't have killed Jay White's, White's momentum, momentum this early. Because he just won the championship, what, last month? January. January, yeah. January. And uh, he beat Tanahashi for it. Tanahashi's also there. But to be fair, Takahashi is still to return. There's a whole bunch of people that are... are do to come back. Okay. But again, they still have Juice Robinson. Again, though, not that their roster is depleted or that they're on the ropes. I'm just curious to where they go from here. Cause they've lost a lot of top contenders in a in a really short space of time. So where they go is interesting to me. It's just interesting. Yeah. And uh I wonder if I wonder if this year, they can reach the heights they did in the last couple of years because, again, they just haven't depleted the roster. And also, they tried it before with uh, Omega and Jay White and AJ Styles and Finn and all that to try and reach a more Western audience. Yeah. And that's why they put those guys in such high positions. Yeah. But it seemed like the experiment almost failed in a way. Jericho included was in, in that Western invasion yeah. thing. I feel like the experiment kind of failed in a way in terms of they couldn't get full Western expansion, which they were never no. going to. No. So it's like it may still be somewhat of a success because they got more eyes on their product, but I feel like it's a, a bit of a failure in the, in the terms of I don't think the, I don't think Western audiences took it took to it the same way that they wanted it to. Yeah. Because Jericho brought in a lot of eyes from the fact that it was Jericho. Yeah. So people tuned in for Jericho, but how many they retained off of Jericho is a, a whole question in itself, which I don't know. Yeah. Same thing with Omega. People would watch Omega, but 
Did it retain with Omega? I don't know. I still think New Japan is one of the best companies in the world right now. Yeah. But it's just a, a question that I have in, with myself is what, where, where, do, where do they go now? That's the thing. Because now they're going back to Okada. And you kind of want to see the, the uh, system, per se, move forward. Yeah. And I feel like putting it back on Okada this soon is kind of a step back. I think... Because what I see from guys like Styles, Omega, Jericho, Balor, even Shinsuke, yep. in WWE, they're known as the guys who made their name on the indies. They Styles more TNA, but they made their name in New Japan. And once they leave, it's like it's hard to go forward from there because the only guys they have to actually stay around, the only guys, the only guys they have that can really keep them up is guys like Okada, uh, Naito, Tadahashi, Ibushi, all them, all them. So they're really, and you're right. It is. I do believe it's viewed at least as a bit of a failure. It put them on the map, but with more, more, but with so many of them that left, it's hard to see them go a direction besides backwards. Like, like you kind of need to go backwards first to go forwards? Kind of, yeah. Okay, I can see that. That's that's true. Yeah. Because you kind of need to put it on uh, Okada again just to move forward. They, they brought in so, these guys brought in so many fans. So if they see Okada at, its, at his greatest, maybe that could keep those fans back. Yeah, and that's true. Jay White might get his call. actually big push moment later on. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I agree with that. that that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Um. But uh, overall, I thought the show was decent. I don't think it was great or amazing because I felt like the first half of the show really dragged. Yeah. The first half is a bit of a, a, a stretch. Probably the first like third of the show, other than Osprey, Jeff Cobb. Yeah. Oh, God, really dragged because it was, it was in the Ring of Honor zone where it was like, hmm... The storytelling is kind of waving mm. around, and it's not that great. So, and the Women of Honor match was fucking terrible. Yep. So, you know, it was it was it was above average. I would say, I would give it like probably a six and a half, seven. I, out of I was 10 about overall. to say a seven. Overall, I would think I I think I would probably push it to a seven because the New Japan shows and uh, the New Japan matches and the the ladder match at the end really boosted the show. Yeah, and the end zone cast thing. Yeah, so I would probably give it a seven. I was thinking a seven. Yes. Um, MSG was great. It was at Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, well, it was our first time in New York, so it was actually we were hoping Takeover would be there. Yeah, but imagine if Takeover was at the mi- Garden. Right. We'll get there, but but. It was great to at least go to the garden. Yeah. And honestly, the place is actually pretty fucking amazing. It's pretty fucking... Like, it's a different atmosphere to what you're used to. Yeah. Just because it's the garden. Yeah. And, like, the the crowd wasn't any different than any other crowd. No. But the building itself, it's like, you know what you're in. You know you're in the garden right now. And you're yep. fully aware of it at all times. And you're like, wow, I'm in the fucking garden exactly. right now. This is crazy. Yeah. I wish that they still had... The entrance from the side. Because it's so much It was so distinct. Better. It was so distinct to Madison Square Garden. And I and people were talking about this when they, they changed the garden and renovated yeah. the garden. People were like, damn, it's gonna it's gonna lose that garden feel. And yeah. people were like, no, nah, it won't, it's the garden. But that is a very distinct feature of the garden, is that when you walk out from the locker room, you're literally right in the fucking middle. Yeah. You're right there on the ice or whatever it is. Yeah, it's ice. Well, I think no, no, no. Yeah, it, yeah. it is the ice. But I'm just saying, like, yeah, like whatever it may be, whether it's the ice, the, the ring, ring, the fucking uh, court, if it's like Basketball. whatever, I don't know. it's all like right there. Yeah, and it made it such a unique feel. Yes. So I kind of wish that that was there, but um, speaking of unique, and uh, speaking of Enzo and Cass jumping the barricade, let's talk about uh, probably my the worst part of this weekend. And the the thing that like kind of hurt my heart the most. Yeah. So the Hall of Fame was on on Saturday as well. We didn't go because we were at the at the G one show. Yeah. 
And after we get back, we, when we got back, we were talking about it. We're like, Enzo and Cass is going to be like on everyone's mind. Like, I want to see what people have to say about this that. This was just that. on the bus, too. Yeah, we're like, we have to see what people are saying about uh, Enzo and Cass jumping the barricade and whatever. Yeah. So we're at the Port Authority, and we get some Wi-Fi, and we're looking on Instagram. And then we, we don't see Enzo and Cass. Nope. We see, well, actually, the first post that I saw was, Enzo and Cass jumped the guardrail and Dash Wilder sparked some dude out. What a fucking night. And I was like, what? Yeah. So then we're looking. It didn't take that long to, to find it. It was no. like 10 seconds. And then you see it. And this jackass at the Hall of Fame jumped the barricade, sprinted all the way into the ring, and tackled Bret Hart during his speech for the Hart Foundation and for Jim Neidhart. It wasn't really because they're inducting the Hart Foundation so it's his acceptance speech but it's not really It wasn't his. even his acceptance it speech because he's already in the Hall of Fame. It was him accepting on Jim's behalf. It's him talking about his relationship with Jim and yep. his and Jim's relationship with WWE. Yeah and Natalia's in there and and, yeah. it, and it's what one or two months after. Yep not too long not probably, too long ago Jim Neidhart passed away. Probably November, December. Yeah. It's some fuck nut mm -hmm. sprints all the way down to the ring, slides in, and tackles Bret Hart mid-speech. Yeah. And it's just... it. And I was talking to Dixon about this as well. That was probably the worst one you could have done it for outside of like... Maybe Tori Wilson. Fair, yeah. Because Tori Wilson's a, like a, a woman, and she, like he would have gotten it worse if he oh, tackled Tori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like because it was Brett, like it was still really not good for him because it's fucking Brett Hart. It's Brett Hart. So he, Brett is the worst one that you could possibly done. Yeah. That was a male. Out of the people, because the other ones, you're, cause, but I know why he did it to Brett. It's because you're not going to do it to any of the other any of the other ones no. because they're all. There, most of them are factions. Harlem Heat. You have Harlem Heat, DX, DX. Uh, the Hart Foundation, and then you had a Honky Tonk Man or Brutus Beefcake, which you could have done it to as well. Yeah, but and, Brutus but, Beefcake. But Brutus Beefcake and Honky Tonk Man, if you tackle them, you would still get the shit kicked out of you, but it would have not been the same well, way. Well, Honky Tonk Man, he wouldn't have taken it. Cause Honky Tonk Man would have fucked him up. Oh, yeah, and Brutus Beefcake Brutus probably Beefcake had his, probably still he still would have fucked him up. Did he have his fucking barber I don't know. shot? Thing? I didn't see. If he did, I don't, the I, guy's getting stabbed. Yep, yep. But yeah, Brett, that was a really tasteless move. Stupid. And uh it's just stupid. Let's uh also I want to dedicate this podcast on top of Nipsey Hustle to uh Dash Wilder. Thank Mainly you for Dash your Wilder. services. Also <laughs> Travis, Travis Brown, Brown and uh Davy Boy Jr. Davy Boy Jr. Um that, those are the three. Those, Those are the, are the main three. Because three, the three they kicked the shit out of him. Yes. And Dash Wilder only needed one punch to do it. Travis Brown came in and he fucking went in on him. Then my favorite part was Davey Boy came in late. Yeah. And, and he, he just jumped on the fucker. And he just fucking started raining down fists on that apron on the hardest part of the, the ring. The thing is, Travis Brown went in and then people started getting him out and he backed off. Davey Boy went in late. And still kick the shit out of him, even and though they had, had it fully under control. Him off, Bull, yeah. B pause. B yeah. Big show. Big show. When it was like, "Yo, stop right now. This could be a huge PR nightmare if you yeah. keep going. Like, let's chill." And then Dash Wilder carrying him out is just like <laughs> takes a look around. He just takes a look around. He's like, "Yeah, fuck it," and just sparks him out with one. Knocks him out. One punch. Knocked him out. One punch and just walks off. Cold. And that was the best part. He walked off because he knew he couldn't stay there. Yeah, or else if he stayed there, he probably there probably would have been an even bigger PR commotion, nightmare. PR yeah. nightmare. But he was smart to just walk off. He just walked. And it was beautiful. Yep. And oh. it was so good to see that happen. And uh I don't want to spend too much time on this no, because that's exactly what that guy wants is exactly. for us to give him attention. So we're not going to. His name, but it's, who he is, and, and... Doesn't matter. Well, it's been released already. Doesn't matter. Fuck him, yeah. Fuck him. Let we're, not, him. we're not saying his name. Yeah. We're not going to give him any shine. No. Because uh, this is exactly what he probably would have wanted. Like so To create buzz about him. Yeah, so we're not going to do that. But it's something that we had to address with the weekend that happened. Yeah. So... So we'll move on from there and we'll get into the real meat and potatoes of the weekend, the WWE shows. Yep. I guess, you know what? What? 
I was thinking, want to start with WrestleMania, end off like with a huge bang that was TakeOver? Or no, you... we're going to start with TakeOver. Okay. So, you know, don't cut okay. me off. That's fucking... Well, don't ever cut me off again. I didn't don't ever cut me cut off cut again, you, off. you son of a bitch. You stopped don't and said ever what? Don't ever cut me off again. You sa- yeah, I did. I said, I said, what are you, what are you looking at? I, I, I addressed don't, it. Don't I addressed ra- it. Don't raise your voice when, when you have to go back and realize you were the one who made the mistake. I addressed it. Don't look at me with that face or else it'll get that way permanently. It'll stay that way permanently. <laughs> it'll stay that way. What other parent speech type things <laughs> can I include? I'm not mad. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm just disappointed. That's a good one. That's I didn't it. even think about that one. That's a good one. People won't know what the fuck we're talking about, but it's okay. We'll explain it another time. Probably Anyways, won't, but probably won't. But, but it, we we'll just say we'll get back to it. We won't. It's just, it's not important. It's just funny. Yeah. So we'll get back to it. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> anyways, over. let's do not interrupt <laughs> me, you son of a bitch. Okay. Yeah. That that's on me. That time that was on me. That that. that my bad. That are you sure? <laughs> that's that's on, that's, that's on me. That's on me. My, Anyways, my bad. Oh, uh, we'll get back to that too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so let's start on the Friday with NXT Takeover New York. Um, do we want to go match by match, or do we want to just uh broad overview it? This is getting. We'll into- go. We'll go. It's not that. No, it's not that long at all. We're all, we're only an hour in. Oh, fair. Yeah. All right. You know what? Let's start with the broad overview and just see where it takes us. If let's we do get that. into match by match, we get into match by match. Yeah. So let's start off with uh, a broad overview of Takeover New York. What did you think of the show? Um, I haven't watched the whole show back yet, but from the first experience there, best show I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Amazing. In terms of including like pay per views and all that. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah. Wow. Like. Yeah. Jesus. If I watch it back, it, it could change, but it's the best show I've ever seen because I was there, including the WrestleMania and the G1 of that weekend. But... What do you mean including the WrestleMania and the G1? It, the atmosphere there was too. Those were great shows, but TakeOver is still amazing. Yeah. And I'm saying it's probably the best show I've ever seen, and I'm saying that it's probably because of the atmosphere and because I was oh, there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like each match delivered, uh, that if the match didn't, the match at least delivered what was expected, but Mm -hmm. I think most matches delivered above that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me go into it now a bit. Um, so I was at New Orleans last year. Yep. For takeover, how many? Let's see how many times I can mention that I was in New Orleans last year for I think Mania. That's two or three? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's I think it's three. Anyways, uh, I was at the takeover show last year in New Orleans. That's four. four. I was at the takeover show. Okay, no, just I can't go if I don't start. But then I, if I I'll start, count, I'll we keep stop. track. You just go. Okay. Takeover New Orleans last year. Okay, at the Smoothie King Center. I was there, and when I was there, um, that show last year, I think TakeOver New Orleans is probably, I think at this point, before, let, let's, let's just say going up into New York, New Orleans was the best TakeOver show, I think. I think, like, by far, it was the best TakeOver show, and that shows how good that show is because of how great every TakeOver show is. So if it's by far the best TakeOver show, that means that it's fucking incredible. This year, in New York, we saw the card. People saw the card and was like, this could top last year, potentially, right? Yeah. Like, people were like, this could, like, this has potential to top New Orleans. Yeah. So... But everyone's like, mm, it probably won't because... Champ is out. Because one champ is out. But New Orleans was just so good of a show yeah. that it's hard to be better than that. Yep. Two years in a row. Yeah. They were better than that. Yeah. <laughs> New York topped New Orleans for me. I thought that it was absolutely fantastic from top to bottom. The only weak point in the show, I thought, and it wasn't even a weak point... It was just a good point where everything else was like amazing. It's the and this was just point. and this was just like good to great where everything was like amazing. 
Yeah. Was the women's four way. Yeah. I thought that was the only one where it was like, eh. And it kind of got put into the eh spot because it was like in between two insane matches. I just I forgot until now fucking Io Shirai's when she got DDT. The DDT? Oh, yeah. I think God. we'll get into each match individually. We probably in will. So, overall as a show, it was like, even last year's atmosphere in New Orleans did not compare to this year's atmosphere when it got into some of those matches. Even though I think last year's crowd was maybe a bit hotter. Yeah. Like, it may have been a bit more of a hot crowd last year, but this year the crowd was like super, super invested in what was going on. And on top of that, it was almost like this year the crowd wasn't trying to be a part in the show. Yeah. They were trying to be a part of the show yeah. and fully watching the show, which I thought was awesome. So... I think let's go match by match for TakeOver because there's only five matches. We yeah. won't do this for Mania, but for TakeOver, let's do it. All 15 matches. Yeah. <laughs> so let's do it for TakeOver. Take team match. Start so, off. really? Yep. Really? You just want to do this? Yep. You want to do this? Is that is that what we're doing now? You just you just blurt out, <laughs> blurt out fucking introductions? Left, right, and so is that what you do now? We're Raiders versus Alistair Black and Ricochet. For fuck's sake. <laughs> Anyways, let's start... <laughs> Let's start uh, with the first match on the card, Candice LeRae versus Leah. All right, yeah. It was decent. Let's go to the first match <laughs> of the actual card, though. Um, the War Raiders versus Alistair and Ricochet. I thought this match was very, very, very good. Ooh. What? Not great. Well, I, well, I, I added a lot of varies. <coughs> I okay. would say it's I, I would say it's in the great category. Okay. I think it's okay, let's Get say into it. let's say let's do our own Meltzer ratings of five stars. Okay. So before we start, we had this conversation a whole bunch of times about what's a five star match. Yeah. And to us, I you can vouch for me on this if you want. Yeah. A five star match to me, it has to be the one of the best matches you've ever seen because yeah. it's a perfect match. Yeah. And you don't get a whole bunch of perfect matches every year. Yeah. You get, like, perfect matches are usually few and far between to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you don't get a perfect match every fucking day. No. Or even every month. No. It happens, like, once in a while. And it's like, you know, because if you have to think about it, if you have to go... Mm, that 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 could have been a five star. Maybe that was a five star match. Yeah. Then it's not a five star match. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not a five star match if you have to think about it. If you have to go, ooh, that could have been a five star. It's bordering between four point seven five and five. It's not it's, a five star match. It's a four point seven five star match. Yeah. So let's start there. Yep. Because uh, to me, like the five star matches in history is like, uh, I would say, uh. <clears throat> I'm going to start in the mid-90s and move up because everything before that, we kind of have a skewed view on. Yeah. So I would say that the five-star <clears throat> matches in history to me are, in WWE at least, are Razor and Shawn, yep. Mania 10. I would say uh, Bret and Austin at Mania 13. Yeah. I would say, would I give it to Mick... And Undertaker in Hell in a Cell? I don't know. Hmm. Probably not. Let's not let's not include that one. So I'll give it to, to those two that I just said. I would give it to both Sean Taker matches. For the WrestleMania match. WrestleMania's. Okay, yeah. I would give it to uh Sean and Angle yep. at Mania twenty one. I would give it to Punk and Cena at Money in the Bank. And I would give it to Gargano Almas and Gargano Champa. Okay, yeah. And those are the only ones that Style I give it to. Style Cena Rumble? Mm, by Meltzer's ratings, yes. By my ratings, no. 4.75? Yeah. Okay, It'd be yeah. like as close as you can get to perfection without it being perfect. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Because that is still a fantastic match. Yeah. But that's that's how strict I think five stars should be. Yeah. 
because I don't think St- uh, Styles Cena is on the level of any of the matches I've just mentioned. Okay, I, you're right. I, I I agree with you. On but that. on Meltzer's ratings, by Meltzer's standard, it should be a five star match by yeah. his standard. But to me, it's not. Okay, yeah. So let's go by our standards for this show. Okay. So what would you give the tag match between the War Raiders and Alistair and Ricochet? Because are you with me in terms of uh, the five-star rating that yeah, I yeah. do? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? Tag match. No, I mean, uh, what do you think about the how the rating system is and how it well, should yeah, be? Well, yeah. I agree with you. It, the fi- a five-star match should be perfection. It should... You should look at the match and see that as there are. No you should see it as like to me. I feel like it. This should be like a wow. That's like a once in a lifetime match. There's no flaws in that match. Yeah. You should look at it and see there. I don't see a flaw in that match. That's five stars. But not even that. It's not there. Not it's. I don't think it should be that. There's no flaws in that match because you physically can't make a perfect match. No. But I think it should be like a match that you're like this is once ever. Yeah. Like I will never. Twice in a lifetime. Like, this is a match that is so excellent in its own unique way yeah. that it'll be really hard to either top this or even to match this. Yeah. That's what I say. Yeah. Which is why, like, I wouldn't give Sean Undertaker in the cell in 97 five stars. I wouldn't give Owen and Brett in the steel cage of five stars. I wouldn't give... um. Uh, what other is there any of the five star matches that I'm missing that he's given out? I don't think so. Don't think so. The okay, ladder match, the ladder match from New Orleans. The ladder, the six man ladder match. Yeah. As great as that was, I wouldn't give it five stars. Even though yeah. I do think that that's the best ladder match I've ever seen. Yeah. Okay, that's another one. I would give Sean and Jericho at No Mercy five stars. Yeah. So, like, those are matches that I'm looking at. I'm like, those are absolutely like. Like, this may be a match that I'll never see again. Yeah. Like this, because everything that led up to it is so perfect. The story leading up to it, the match itself, and the outcome and everything that went with it is five stars. Yeah. So, so you're, you're in agreement? Yep. Okay, so let's start with uh, Alistair and Ricochet versus the War Raiders, and let's break down the match a bit first and then go into the rating. Yeah. So, going into this match, we knew Alistair and Ricochet is going to be on Mania. Yeah. So, I think at the start of the match... People kind of felt like it was a foregone conclusion that the War Raiders are going to win. Yeah. And Alistair and Ricochet are going to lose. Yeah. But then partway through the match, it started to get into a zone of like, whoa, but what, what if? What yeah. if Alistair and Ricochet won and they walked into Mania with the titles and all this kind of shit? Yeah. And then they really did a great job, these two teams, of drawing us in yeah. to the match and really thinking Alistair and Ricochet are going to win. And all the action that went into it and the storytelling that went into it with the 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 match itself. Yeah. Really added to the the match and elevated it beyond a point of just physically what we were seeing. And then uh, of course uh, in the end though, the War Raiders eventually beat Alistair and Ricochet. Yeah. And Alistair and Ricochet got a proper send off well. yeah. from NXT, which was really nice to see. Yep. And it was super emotional. Ricochet was crying. Alistair was straight faced because he doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. And like people in the crowd are just chanting their ass off, like, thank you to those guys and giving them the right send off that they deserve. Yeah. So now, uh, what were your thoughts on uh, the match as a whole? As a whole? Um, I thought it was a great match. To me, excellent opener. Yes. Yeah. To me, one one of the greatest tag team matches I've ever seen. Mm. Not the greatest. One but of them. one of the greatest. Yeah. Um that's a that's a really big claim. Yeah. Cuz just it, it was cuz like you said going to the match you're like they're probably going to lose. Mm-hmm. But it hit that zone or it's like they could win. Mm-hmm. They could win and walk into WrestleMania as tag team champs. That'd this be crazy, could happen. Right? This, oh my gosh! And it got it got to that point where like this could happen. And then you're also watching the match and you're seeing how it's trending towards. Yeah. And everyone's like, they're gonna win. It's they're it gonna got fucking to that point win. It's going to happen. And then it and then it didn't. It but, didn't. But it didn't take anything away from yeah. the match. It's like it got it came back and War Raiders won. It's like okay. Not gonna lie, they had me in the second half. Yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, for me, I don't. I wouldn't. Pro- I probably wouldn't give it like one of the best tag matches I've ever seen. Yeah. Because I definitely think there are better tag matches out yeah. there. Yeah. I'm looking at you DIY, DIY and Revival, Revival two, two out of three, three falls. falls. Jinx, I'm looking Coke. at a uh, uh, Ben Juan Jericho and uh, Austin and Triple H. Yep. You know, I'm looking towards like those as well. But that doesn't take away from how great of a match yeah. this was. To be fair, now that I'm thinking about it, this is still up there as like <coughs> like a really great tag match. Yeah. I would I would I would I would agree with you then in terms of like one of. Yes. It's not the best it's, though. It's definitely not the best, but I it, would to I would me, I would say it's one of though. So for that as a rating, I would give it 4.5 stars. Okay. Because, like I said, it's one of the greatest tag team matches I've ever seen. But when I compare it to, I believe DIY Revival is better. And when I compare it to that, to me, something is missing. Yeah. And, and, and it brings w- it down to But the bit. thing that is missing is the fact that we never really, really believed yeah. that Alistair and Ricochet were going to win. Exactly. That was the only thing that was missing. Yeah. So and and at for the me, same time, I would I would probably agree. I would go four point five to four point seven five yeah. ish in that area, but I would probably give it a four point five. Yep. So, and that's a really good score for anyone that's out there. That's a ninety percent for us. So that's really good. Yeah. And like, cause for the most part. Average matches to Meltzer are like four stars, four point two five stars. That's not to us. No. To us, an average match would be like three point five, three point two five. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now, uh, yeah, I would give it four point five to four point seven five as well. Yeah. I just thought it was a, a great opener. I would probably give it four point five. Yeah. I'll say four point five with you. And uh, <laughs> hot opener got the crowd ready for the rest of the event. Yeah. Now. Let's move into the second match, Velveteen Dream and Matt Riddle for the North American Championship. Yeah. What did you think of this match? Really good match. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, Velveteen Dream showed us something that he's shown before, but to me, I believe he took it to another level. I feel this like match. this match show was the most babyface fire that he's ever shown. Yeah. Like, to the point where, like, Matt Riddle was, like, becoming the heel in the match. Yeah. And uh, the crowd was so behind Velveteen Dream, except yeah. for Dixon. Because uh, it's Matt Riddle, man. <laughs> yeah, but Velveteen bro. Dream, bro. Bro. <laughs> bro. Yeah, yeah that, that match, to me, I thought that that was a great match as well. Some people say yeah. it was, like, a weaker part of the show. No. I don't agree. No. Do I think it was better than... The three best matches. I think this was probably the fourth best match on the show, Same. which is saying something about the show itself. Exactly. Because I thought this match was like this match on a different takeover would have stolen the show. Yeah. Like probably in uh, not Phoenix. What was before that? War Games? Yeah. <coughs> probably not War Games, but Brooklyn 4, this would have stolen the show. Yeah. If this was Brooklyn 5. I don't know. It, it would still be a WrestleMania takeover. So, like, if I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't I, either. I, I'm I, talking about. I'm talking about on a different takeover. Yeah, this would have probably stolen the okay, show. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, cause that's the level of match it was. Or actually, let's say this: if that match was on like Mania this year, it probably would have stolen oh, the show. Oh yeah, hundred percent. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah. Or if this was on the G1 show, Sto- this would have stolen the show. Yes. And so that's the level that we're dealing with. But that match was great. Velveteen Dream wins with like a a kind of Shayna Baszler, Kyrie Sane esque finish where uh, he flips back on the the Brolition and uh, pins him one two yeah. three. Then uh, Matt Riddle teases the heel turn, but he does it. He just pounds the fist and he's happy again. And he's like, "Oh, okay, dope." And then he Good just job, walks bro. off, and Good job, Velveteen bro. Dream celebrates with the title. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Overall, I thought this match was really well paced. Uh. I felt like Matt Riddle did a great job of, I think, anchoring the match. Yeah. Because I think that had a lot to do with him. Yes. Because Matt Riddle is genuinely, to me, one of the best wrestlers on the planet. Yeah. I, I honestly think that. He, he truly showed it in this match. Yeah. Like, I completely think that Matt Riddle is, like, top f- 
five on the planet right now in terms of in-ring work. Yeah. So, you know, seeing that match really showed that level as well. Yeah. And uh, so what what would you give this match? With all this, I would give it 4.5, maybe 4.25, but I'm leaning mm. a lot more towards a 4.5. I am too. because it was a great match, and again, it, it, it was just missing something. I don't know what it was. Yeah. I think I don't know what it was about the match. Maybe it was time. Maybe it was no, but they got a decent amount of time. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but it was it was it, it just didn't get to that higher higher part of it. Yeah, and I think it might have to do a bit with investment in the storyline that you couldn't possibly get yeah. higher than a four point five, even though people were invested in both guys individually. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Maybe yeah. it was because it followed the tag match. Yeah. It could be that because I believe second match on the card. I think the tag match was better. Yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah. So. And uh, but I don't know what it was. Yeah, something there's just an intangible that we don't know that took away a bit from uh, it being able to be better than a four point five. Yeah, but four point five was like the maximum it could have been, and it was. Yeah, and it was that. Yeah. So I would give it a four point five as well. So uh, after that match, after that fun match. Uh, let's get into another fun match. Uh, fun is the word I'd use. <laughs> Pete Dunn and fucking Walter. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I'll start off uh, with a little bit of a, a breakdown of this match. You know, I'll break down it uh, uh, in a, a couple seconds here. Just, ah, ah, ah. How was that for a breakdown? It, I, I, I would put it like that, but maybe a bit more. Oh, uh, <laughs> did you just oh come? No, did you just uh, come? No, <laughs> no. Yeah, not in a bad way, just in a very painful way. Because I don't know if you noticed during the match, if you're watching at home, uh, watching with visual, watching with video. Yeah. Um, Walter chopped the shit out of Pete Dunn, and no one said shit in the crowd. Walter, no one wooed. Yeah, nobody. No there was not one woo during that match. Maybe a small like f at his first chop. Maybe a small like whoa. Oh. Yeah, no one. Uh, no one wooed. No, because <laughs> Walter just killed him. It, <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> and then Pete Dunne killed him back. They both, exactly. They both just killed each other. And just like beat the living shit out of each other. Yeah. Proper UK strong style. And yeah. it was awesome to watch. But the thing is that the crowd, I, and this was something that I was scared of. I don't know if the crowd at home got the full effect of it because the people in the crowd weren't watching. Or, 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 or weren't no. reacting, sorry. Yeah. Not, not that we weren't watching. We weren't reacting. That was a Because it nice was talk. hard to react. Like, we weren't reacting in the crowd in the, in the traditional way where everyone's on their feet and they're losing their minds and all that until, like, the later part yeah. of the match. But during the match, during the buildup and all that, we were just all like wincing the whole time. Because you can see how much they're fucking beating the shit out of each other when you're there live. Outside of the camera cuts. Because and, and you could see it and you could hear it. But you can hear it in a different way than you can in video. Because yeah. in the video, the mic picks it up. There's no fucking mic. Nope. They're just killing each other. Yep. So... <laughs> Like, you're just like, oh, my God, don't die. Yes. Just please be that. okay. And, you know, Pete Dunn's breaking his fucking fingers. You hear like, his fingers fucking pop. Like, it's fucking gross. It was gross. Just, just from him just spreading his fingers and doing and just spreading uh, it like that, you hear a... Uh, you hear a... It's like, oh! Uh, you just hear it. You just... Oh, my God, I couldn't. I just fucking couldn't during that match. It was so much. Yeah. It was too much to take <laughs> in. Like, oh, my God. That was one of the most brutal matches that I've seen in a while. Yeah. In a while. And it, there was no weapons. No weapons. They didn't need it. They just needed Walter and his fucking hand. And they needed Pete Dunn and fucking Pete Dunn. Like, Jesus Christ. So, let's get outside of the match for a second. Pete Dunn's 680-day-plus reign comes to an end 
at the big fucking hand of <laughs> of Walter. And this was my only issue with the with the post match with the overall thing. Okay, is that they didn't really give Pete Dunn that moment after the match, which I think they should have. Yeah, because that's six hundred and eighty <laughs> fucking days. That is the longest reign in the modern era. Like, that's a feat in itself, and it didn't really get paid that much attention. No. And they just kind of brushed it aside, like like as, as, as if it was just another title change. Yeah. But it wasn't. It, it was, was bigger not. than that. You know? So, I don't know. That was the only thing that kind of left a bit of like, oh, that, that would have been nice. And here's the thing. I, I'm going to get into a little bit of a rating here, but... The match was fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. So for me, the match itself, five stars. Mm -hmm. But again, it's hard for me to look at the match without looking at the celebration. Really? It, kind of. Like, it's hard for me to That's look weird. at this five-star match without looking at Pete Dunn not getting that recognition of a 600-plus day reign. Which is why it's hard. I it's hard for me to say it's a four point seven five to me. Weird. That's a weird reason to drop I anything because it wasn't post match shenanigans. No, no. It was just that something. It's just something that they could have added. But, but I don't think me, that I don't think that that takes away from the match though. I know because the match and the post match is separate. <clears throat> yeah. You know. So. And, and and for most matches it's like that, but for some reason with this match, it's it's hard for it's harder for me. So that, that's weird. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Why? It, it just doesn't. I don't know. It, it, that just doesn't make sense to me is what I'm saying. Really? Like, because the match is the match. And then the post match was a, a celebration, a standard celebration. But you, Pete Dunn never got his, his due, really. He never got that. No, but I know. I know. But I'm saying thank if that, you, Pete if that was added. If that was added, that would have been nice, but that doesn't add anything to the match, though, is what I'm saying. Like, like the match would not be better or worse if Pete Dunne gets that not at the end. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, like it wouldn't change anything in the match itself. But it changed my – looking back at the match, it changed my – feeling towards the match okay, it changed well, my emotion oh, okay about yeah the match. sorry about that i should probably have ex explained before we did the ratings i'm trying to do an objective rating yeah. though like outside of and, subjective. and that's why i said objectively obje objectively of the match yeah five stars okay okay yeah I, I should have specified objectively of the match five stars but for your personal enjoyment it's less now because pete dunn didn't get that yeah. due Okay. Yeah, sorry. But yeah, we're talking about objectively only rating it though. Okay. We're not we're not rating the whole experience of the match cuz then us being there adds like 5 pounds to the camera. Exactly. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so we're just talking about objectively in the matches. Yeah. Yeah. So but for me, I would not give it 5 stars. Ooh. I would actually give it 4.75 stars. Just because uh I feel like I don't know. It, it was just missing that something again to make it a five-star match. Because okay. as amazing as the match was to me, it was not one of the best matches that I've ever seen. Okay. Like, that was not on like a Sean Undertaker level or a Sean Angle level or a Johnny and Champa or a Johnny and Almas like level to yeah. me. So I would give it a 4.75 because it was as close as... To being that as it could have been without it being that. All right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And that's the thing. It, and that's what I'm saying about like five stars again to everyone. It's very few and far between. You don't yeah. get a lot of five star no. matches. Which is why I'd give it a 4.75 star. Because it's as close to the ultimate that it could be yeah. without it being that. Because it didn't give me those, oh, oh, like... Oh my goodness, what the fuck are we watching right now? I've never seen anything that'll ever come close to this moment. Okay. Even though I still thought it was so fucking good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Am I coming through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you way? mean. Yeah. It, it, I, that's, that's where we differ because to me... It was. I felt those things. But the, the, yeah. the other thing though is that I've watched... Uh, like British independence wrestling before. Yeah. And I've seen Valter before because this is the first time you've ever seen him. Yeah. 
So it kind of differs in that way too. Yeah. Because you've never seen that. And like that's such a culture shock yeah. that it's like, oh my God, like what the fuck? This is incredible. And it was incredible. It's not it's not any less incredible. Yeah. It's just, it's it's just not to me, it's just not five stars. Yeah. Cause I don't even think it's the best match Walter's ever had. Okay. So because Walter actually had a match last week against uh, Devlin, Jordan Devlin in OTT, yeah. that I actually thought may have been better. Right. Or if it wasn't better, it was close in quality. Yeah. And I don't consider that match to be five stars either. Yeah. So that's, that, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing about it. But uh, objectively, it's like 4.75 to a 5, but it's not quite a 5. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But it was still excellent. Since you're asking that question, it's a 4.75. Yeah. Exactly. However, <clears throat> however, on Meltzer's rating scale, that should be a five star match. Oh, yeah. If that's not a five star match, Meltzer's I. Meltzer's rating scale, that should be higher than a five star match. Well, with what he's established now. Yeah, exactly. But that should be a five star match yeah. on Meltzer's rating scale because it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Now, from there, we'll move into the fatal four way with the women. Yeah. This was the. Weakest part of the show to me. Yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with circumstance yeah. more than the actual match itself. That's true. Because it just came after this exhausting, brutal brawl between the bruiserweight and fucking Walter, right? Yeah. Like, so they kind of got caught in an unfortunate position. However, even in that unfortunate position, they still put on an excellent showing and everyone was super invested. Yeah. What were your thoughts on uh, the four-way? I thought... It was a great match. Like like you said, it's the weakest part of the show, which is unfortunate. Um, but besides that, I thought each one of the girls did amazing in the match. And the match as a whole turned out to be great. Much better than the G1 show. Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I believe it's better than uh, Moon, Shayna last I year, agree. too. I yeah. agree. I think this was a, a better women's match than... Uh, I actually think this was the best... Women's match since I would probably say Asuka and Ember Moon okay. at B Brooklyn. Yeah, all right, yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair. Because Shane and Bianca was <laughs> cool, but I didn't think it was that great. Mm. Uh, what other? Shana what other? Kyrie's there's Shane. Shane and Kyrie was cool. Yeah, that was a good match. But I, I, I think this was better than yeah. Shane and Kyrie. So I would say, yeah, I would say that this is the best women's match since. Uh, Oscar Ember. Oscar Ember on a takeover show. Yeah. I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so excluding uh, Charlotte Becky Oscar, excluding the last women standing between excluding Charlotte Becky. Candice LeRae and whoever Aaliyah. she faced. Aaliyah. Aaliyah. Yeah. yeah, excluding that too. So Because yeah. that was on the taping. That wasn't on the takeover show. That was that was viewed this Wednesday. Yeah, so. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but I, I actually think that that was the best takeover women's match since Oscar and Ember yeah. at Brooklyn. Th th three. Three. It would three? Been three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what would you give this? I'd probably give it a four point two five. Mm. Fair. Yeah. I would probably give it like a four. Okay. Or a three point seven five. Okay. I would probably give it a four. Yeah, an eighty percent solid eighty yeah. percent. Because I think it was a solid match. I don't think it was a great great match. Yeah. But I thought it was solid. Yeah. Like it was. It was. It was. Great in its own right, but it was it was like solid. That's why. So I'd give it a four. Here's, I thought it was a great match. I thought yeah, it was more than solid because to me, solid is it's the ex. It's going to be a great match. You expect it to be a great match, but I still believe this match still exceeded those expectations. Not yeah, to a but but huge level. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think like average yeah. average for me is three point or three. A yeah. three out of five to me is average, and this is like a whole rating but, but up. But I'm not, I'm not saying the expectation was it was going to be average. I'm saying the expectation of was this that match, it was going to be great, and it was it better. was going to be great, and I do believe it was better than that. Okay, yeah. I, I I could see that. I yeah. but uh, I think I think I would still give it a four because okay. that's that's an eighty percent. That's an eight yeah. out of ten. That's, that's still, still really great. good. That's still a really good score for me. Yeah. For a Meltzer rating scale, I'd probably give it a four point two five or a four point five. Yeah. Uh, but for my personal rating, I'd give it a four. Yeah. Uh, and now, from there, let's move into the main event of the evening. But before we do that, let me tell a little story. It's story time. They can't hear that. Oh, okay. 
Okay, no, bit loud, bit loud, bit loud. That is a bit loud. Oh, sorry. Anyways, uh, so during this show, I was losing my fucking mind. I was going crazy this whole show. Yep. And you can still hear now that my voice is not fully okay. That is from Friday. That is from Friday, that's, yeah. That's from Friday. Yep. So, uh, during the show, I'm jumping up and down. I'm losing my mind. I'm standing up. I'm chanting at the top of my fucking lungs. It's main event time. Gargano Cole. Two out of three falls. I'm so fucking hyped. Yeah. Then just before the match, this uh, lady from behind taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around, and she's like, uh, hi, uh, excuse me, um, this is the main event next, and it's Adam's match. Uh, do you think you can mind if you could uh, sit down before like, or you continue, stay seated? Be- after she said stay seated, at this point, I'm just like, oh, for fuck's sakes, calm down. And yeah. this is one thing I'm like, for fuck's sakes, calm down. If you want to see stand up, like, honestly, it's a great show. We're going to be jumping and standing. And then, yeah. So, so she's like, she taps me on the shoulder. She goes like, uh, excuse me. It's the main event. Uh, do you, th- do you guys think you could stay seated for this match? Uh, like try your hardest to, cause, uh, I'm actually Adam's girlfriend. This is Adam's mom. This is Adam's dad. And this is Adam's brother and whatever. I'm like, oh shit. Cause in my mind, that's exactly what I was yeah. thinking. Cause I was literally going to tell her off. What she said to stay seated. She was like, stay seated. I'm like, I was going to like be like, yo, you're at a wrestling show. I'm going to be standing. Yeah. But then it's like, this is Adam's mom and this is that. And like, it wasn't even for her. It was for the mom. Yeah. And she said she, that. I'm like, the mom has to stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. And I was like, oh, okay. And it's her son wrestling. Yeah. So it makes sense. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, uh, uh, I was like, and I was like, okay. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, like it's like oh fuck. Yeah, because it's like it's like fuck I'm that. Me. And I was like, and I was like, oh no way! Great to meet you guys. Uh, I'll try my best. I don't know if it'll happen, but I'll try. I turn around for a bit, and then like I think I let like five to ten seconds go by. And I'm like, and then I just turn around. and I go. By the way, I'm cheering for Johnny. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm cheering for for Johnny. So I don't know how that affects you. <laughs> they just fucking burst out laughing. They're like, yeah. "Nah, it's cool, whatever." Then I I had the ILC at this time, so I'm like, "He's not gonna sit down." Like, not a not no, because before that, before that, actually, before we switched, yeah, it's like okay, main event time. I'm sitting down, and I'm like, okay, I gotta sit down. Then Johnny's music, or no, was it Adam's music hit first, or Johnny came out yeah, first? I think it was Adam's. So Adam comes out first. Uh, they're standing up. I'm standing up. I'm squatting. <laughs> I'm like, Chuck. no, wait. Did Johnny come out first or did Adam come out first? A- Adam came out. F- I think Johnny came out first. He did. Johnny did come out first. Yeah. yeah. So okay. So I'm sitting down and I'm like, okay, I gotta <laughs> stay seated for this uh, late for for Adam's mom back here. Johnny Gargano's music hits. I and I'm like and like immediately when his music hits, I immediately stand the fuck up. I'm like, yeah, and I turn around. I'm like, sorry, one second, and they're like, they're like, fuck it, it's cool. And I'm like, okay, you guys are awesome, that's good. And I'm like, yeah, Johnny, let's go. Whole crowd's booing. The whole crowd was fucking booing him. I didn't care. I was like Johnny Gargano all the fucking way. I was Johnny Gargano since day one. I'm like, let's go, Johnny. Let's fucking go. You can never tear me apart. So good. And I'm like, and I like stood up and like right when I was like, yeah, sorry, I'm standing up just... After this, I'll sit there like, it's okay. And I was like, yes, Johnny. Then Adam Cole comes out, huge pop. The place goes fucking nuts. Yeah. Adam Cole, baby. And then fucking boom, boom. right? Everyone's going crazy. His mom and his girlfriend and all that are standing up. So I was cool with standing up. You know, we all go, Adam Cole, baby. Then right when the match is starting, Dixon just looks at me and goes, you know what? How about this? Do you want to switch seats? Because we have the aisle. So you can take the aisle so you can stand up, and I'll try my hardest to sit down. Because yeah. Dixon wasn't really jumping up and down at the same frequency that no. I was. 
because I was just out of my seat like more than I was in my seat. Yeah. So you were like, just take the aisle so you can stand in the aisle and you won't be blocking anyone. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that sounds like a plan. So this match starts. The first fall was great. Yeah. It was it was slow in building, but what people don't understand is that this is the main event of a show that has had people pretty much emotionally drained up to this point yeah. because of how good everything was. You need to start slow so that you can draw people in so when the match picks up pace, you will be way more invested than if the match is just at a fast pace the whole time. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. They had 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. So they have time to build, and they needed to build. So that first fall was basically the build. Yeah. And it was a great build, and uh, Adam gets the, first, uh, gets the first fall against Johnny Clean. And honestly, it was very smart for Adam to get that because everybody was behind Adam. Yep. So when Adam gets the first fall, everybody's going to be cheering. Just from him getting the first fall alone, if you weren't in the match, you're in the match now. Yeah, but also, also the thing is that you don't want to see it end on the second fall. Yeah. You want it to go to the third fall. Yeah. So now when Adam is getting these near falls on Johnny, it's way more babyface uh, push for Johnny yeah. because you want to see a third fall. Yeah. So every time Johnny kicks out, you're not you're not even cheering for Johnny if you're cheering for Adam. You're not even cheering for Johnny. You're just cheering that the match is going to continue. Yeah. So then Johnny gets the second fall. He puts uh, – Adam Cole in the, the Fujiwara armbar, uh, Champa's armbar. Uh, Adam rolls out of it, puts him in a, a small package type deal or backslide type deal. Yeah. No, crucifix type deal. That's what That's it is. It, crucifix. A crucifix pin. Uh, Johnny kicks out, puts him in the Gargano escape. Adam taps immediately Smart to make man. sure that he doesn't waste any energy going into the third fall. Genius. Yeah. Brilliant book. It's not like the most original bookie in the world, no, obviously, like it, it, but it's, 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 it's booking that makes sense. That the yeah. heel would tap out really quick. It's like Orton and uh, Bragging Rights Iron Man match, where right it's, at the start of the yeah. match, I think it was like two minutes in, John got his first fall because he got him in the STF and Randy just tapped immediately. Or in an Iron Man match, the heel gets disqualified the first fall. Yeah, it was Brian uh, Sheamus two or three falls where Brian disqualified himself to yep. injure Sheamus the first fall. Exactly. Yeah. Or the Gauntlet match yeah. with Eric Rowan and uh, Kofi, where they disqualifies himself so that uh, the rest of the gauntlet has a exactly. opportunity. So it's just, it's just good heel heat and yeah. good uh, smart, logical booking. Yeah. So now the third fall starts and everyone is fully invested at this point and they're fully back into it. Everybody's and on their feet. Pretty much at this yeah. point. And oh my fucking word, what a third fall. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like, Johnny looked like fucking Superman at this point. Like, yeah. he was so resilient, but it wasn't, to me, it wasn't unrealistic how resilient he no. was. Because it showed his desperation and, like, how he's literally willing to go through fucking hell and back to hmm. get this championship. And he, every single near fall just drew you in more and more and more and more. And then the Undisputed Era come out, and they're like, they hit uh, Johnny with the, their finisher, and everyone's like, no, not like this. Adam gets the cover. One, two, Johnny Kick. kicks out. Everybody. Everyone loses their fucking mind. Yeah. They're like, yes. Then Johnny goes and uh, gets his baby face comeback. He beats up the entire Undisputed Era, but again, not in an unrealistic way. It was like almost kind of lucky. He hits the Tornado DDT on Roderick Strong. He kick, drop kicks uh, Kyle O'Reilly at the same time into yeah. the barricade. DDTs Roderick Strong. The whole Undisputed Era is out. He gets back in the ring. Adam Cole super kick once in his face. And it spins Johnny around. Super, super kick, kick to the back of his neck. He on his knees. He, he hits the ropes. Chop block. Goes off the ropes. Knee to the fucking face. Shining wizard. Everyone's like, no. No, no it's over. That's it. One, two, kick out from Johnny. Everyone lost their fucking... When I say lost their fucking mind, I mean lost their fucking minds. I ran up them damn steps. Dixon fainted. It was... Everything was going I crazy. Lost, I lost... I fell. His fucking knees He's, just buckled. Just, oh, it shit. It was, like, it was like, one, two. I said three out loud as loud as I could be, but he kicked out. I'm like, he 
fuck me. I, I'm like, I ran up them fucking steps. I'm like jumping up and down with this, with Adam's fucking girlfriend. Like we're like losing our minds, like as if we know each other. Yeah. I go back down to Dixon. Dixon's fucking fainted. I'm picking him off of the ground. He's like, I can't fucking do it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just so good. Just drew us in perfectly. Yeah. And then Johnny has his baby face comeback. Adam goes for the Canadian Destroyer again. Uh, Johnny reverses it. Gargano escape. Everyone's losing their fucking mind. G- Adam almost gets to the ropes. He kicks off, flips back over in the middle of the ring. Gargano escape locked in. Adam taps out. Fucking Johnny is the NXT champion. And remember, at the start, they were booing. At the end, everyone was losing their mind that Johnny won. Yeah. And then people forgot that, oh, wait, I was actually supposed to be cheering for Adam. Man, this is some bullshit. People forgot <laughs> that Johnny is John Cena. So he's like, oh, we have to cheer, boo this guy. Oh, fuck off. You were cheering him when you he were won just the cheering. match. You were just cheering. Stop being because a fucking Because it was pussy. amazing. Like, he won. He <laughs> won, and he deserved it. He did a great job, and the match was great. And then everyone cheered so hard when he won and then they went yeah wait no boo Even this the, is okay, some bullshit the guy in front of us he cheered so hard when he, he won. lost his mind when johnny won he was on his feet we high-fived and everything and then at the end of the show he's like adam adam should have won man it's like okay you can think <laughs> that but it's like, like this this main event was bullshit adam should have won it's like, I'm like what are you talking about come on you just lost your mind <laughs> oh Fickle. 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 <laughs> or are we the fickle? No, we're great. They drew us in, though. Because you were cheering for Adam. I was cheering for Adam at the start. I was. Because Adam's family was behind. I don't even know if it was because Adam's family was behind us or just because you were cheering for Adam. I'm no, not sure. I, I, I was very neutral at the start of the match. I'm like, I was cheering for Adam mainly because imagine the swerve that would be. Johnny needs his moment, but Adam wins. Imagine that. Mm-hmm. Sucked me in. Johnny needs to, to win. To be fair, I think the bigger swerve was actually Johnny winning in the end. Yeah. By the time it was done. Because I feel like at the, at the start, it's like, it could go either way. Yeah. Then by the end of it, it's like, Adam's going to win. Adam's <laughs> going to win the fucking match. And then Johnny pulls it out at the fucking end after everything. Like, some people thought it was a bit unrealistic how many times he kicked out. But he didn't really kick out that many times. Or actually, he did, but they were all spaced out. Yeah. They weren't, like, next to each other. They were very, very spaced out. And also, he didn't kick out, like, strong and get up super strong. He was selling his ass off. Yeah. And the kickouts were very necessary. They, they weren't, like, just kick out to kick out and just have a high spot to have a high spot. They all meant so much to the storytelling. So that match was, like, by the time it was over, you were, like... Oh, Johnny's going to lose. He didn't lose. Oh, no. Johnny's losing. Oh, it's fucking over. It's not over. What the fuck? And then Johnny has him in the fucking Gargano escape. And you're like, I don't even fucking know if it's over at this point. What the fuck's going to happen? Tap. Tap, you pussy. Tap. And then he taps out. And you lose your mind. (laughs) So good. And everything about that match was well-paced. It was just a well-paced match. And the... And the... The the match when it kicked into that second gear, second, third, fourth gear, it was just going. Yeah. Like it was just there on was it. No stopping it. No. It was just like running away with it. So, uh, what would you give that match? Five stars. Five stars. Come that on. that match is a five star match. And to me, that is the best match in NXT history. To me. Champa Gargano. To me, I would say this is a better match. Damn. A better match. I okay, yeah. As a match. But they're both excellent <clears throat> for different reasons. Yeah. But this was on another level. No, yeah. Like, oh my god. It was just start to finish. Because the other thing is that last year I felt the storytelling was great, but the storytelling was also in that way where it's like This is a storytelling moment, everyone. Look right here. This is a storytelling moment. Like when uh, Champa sits down next to Johnny and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, we're telling a story right here. Watch. Watch as we tell a story. And that's great in its own right. And it was so unique to any match that I've ever seen. Yeah. And still have ever seen. 
where this one, the storytelling in the match was in the flow of the match itself. Yeah. And you see the storytelling if you look into what the, how the match is being pieced together. And that's how you see the storytelling. And it was more of an actual match than last year. Where I felt like last year's match was almost like an, an angle. Like it was like just one giant 45-minute angle. Fuck. Or like a segment. Yeah. Where this year was like an actual match. Okay, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, like last year was like almost like an angle in a match where this one was just a match. Yeah. And that's why it's like they're both excellent for different reasons. You know? Yeah. But I would say that this match edges it for me. Okay, yeah. It's not by it's not like far and away no. the best match ever cuz Gargano Champ is great too. But this was just wow, stellar. Like that is this is what I'm talking about when I say the five star thing. Once ever matches. Yeah. Like you will never get this fucking mishmash again. No. Like how everything was glued together. You will never get that again. No. Cuz it was just that it was like the perfect storm. Yeah. Where Champa gets injured, Gargano's supposed to have his final moment against Champa. Now Adam Cole's inserted. Now is Adam Cole potentially Adam Cole could just take the moment out. It's so unpredictable. Yeah. And either way it goes, you're happy. But then the match itself, it was like, no, Johnny has to win now. Like, if Adam wins, we're unsatisfied. And like, man, it was just whew. a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster and a half. Yeah. And I, I even told uh, Adam's family after the, the match or the show, one or the other, and I told them, I was like, you guys should tell Adam that, like, that's a match to really be proud of. Yeah. Like, that is a once-ever match. Like, wrestling, okay, it's fake, it's scripted, but even so, wrestlers, when, they, when they're not the ones to go over, they could still look down and say, was that a good match? Yeah. Adam... If you're listening, which you're probably not, which you're probably not. But you're if you most are, definitely not. Yeah. Amazing match, like incredible, and that goes to Johnny as well. Johnny as well, right? And to me, to me, because Johnny's my favorite wrestler, I think it's more so to Johnny. That's not true. It's an equal match. It takes two to tango. Yeah. But now, what did we have this conversation in the last podcast about? I can't remember. Johnny Gargano oh. being regarded as the greatest and is he the greatest and could he be the greatest and that. Did we have that conversation on the podcast or was that just in, in our personal life? I think we planned to. I don't think we did it on the podcast though. Okay, let's talk about it then now for a bit because we also have to get into mania. Just because. And right now I'm going to say this. He is on track to becoming the greatest wrestler of all time. Yep. And I can't say for certain he is the greatest wrestler of all time. Okay. And, and because he he has had a long career, but he hasn't His reached. real his real work is starting now. Yeah, exactly. It's just starting. <clears throat> yeah. His stuff in Dragon Gate and all that was was good too, but it's not what he's doing now. No. Yeah. His, his real work is just he's just getting started. Yeah. And that's the thing, because if How he... How old is he? I'm, I'm going to check. Continue. Because if he just got career-threatening injury today, I believe the most you could view him as is he could have been the greatest wrestler of all time, which sucks. He's 31 years old right exactly. now. Exactly. So he's really like just getting started I find, doing I his find work. most wrestlers reach their peak in their late 30s. Yeah. How old was Shawn Michaels when he uh, started? When he started? Probably like his twenties. Like, let's see. I'm checking. I'm checking. Um, but that's the thing. He is on track because he still has yet. This is all NXT. We have to remember, which is its own. He was brand. probably like 25, 26. Yeah. So, so Gargano still has like quite a lengthy career yeah. ahead of him, bar injury. Yeah, and he, and here's the thing. This is all still NXT, which is the best brand in WWE. Yeah, but it's still a gateway. Yeah, to the main roster. And he, the Undertaker also started when he was twenty five. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. Yeah, and yeah, he did. Johnny is so close. Johnny, Johnny is has been ready and is ready to burst through that gateway, like with ease. It's just the only thing that's holding him back is wrapping up, finishing, 
just Tampa. Fish, finishing what he started. Yeah. He is not finished with NXT. The gate is open. It's ready to take him, but he's not ready to go through it yet. And once he's ready to go through it, he will go through it. And on the main roster, it's going to be very hard for... It'll be very, it'll be very difficult. For them to just do what they've done to Rude. Because also the thing is that in NXT, people I feel... I feel, I don't know, because yeah. I don't really look into that side of things... I feel like people at NXT have a bit more creative freedom with the storytelling they're doing. Yeah. Where on the main roster, it seems very regimented to the writers. Yeah. That's what I feel. I don't know okay. that for sure. But or if or if it's just the fact that NXT's writing team has just been better, I have no clue. Yeah. But the storytelling in NXT is so unique to NXT style that on the main roster you just don't get that. Yeah. I think another big reason to do that 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 has to do with that is that uh, the writers in NXT are uh, people who are wrestling fans because and that's not that's not me saying that it's that I saw I think it was a who was it Triple H that was talking about it it was that uh, people in NXT that are assigned to NXT NXT is basically a volunteer thing to do okay to you they volunteer to work down there yeah. But over time, it became like, no, we're dedicated to NXT and only NXT. Yeah. And that's how, why NXT is how it is now, where it's able to expand. Yeah. Right? Because before, it was like a volunteer, like, oh, can you guys come down for a bit and do this? Now they have like an actual team working dedicated to NXT. Yeah. And those people have to be the people that were wanting to volunteer and willing to do that. <clears throat> so those are all wrestling fans because yeah. they want to do that. We're on the main roster. You get a lot of writers and stuff up there that are, you know, soap opera writers or they were sitcom writers or they were whatever, like different type of writers that weren't wrestling writers. Yeah. So they're writing stories that are not meant all, all the time for wrestling. Yeah. Stuck up little sniveling sellout full of suffering succotash, son. You know, trust me, that was not easy to say. So... I feel like that's with a, audio. I just winked. Yeah, I feel like that's a that's a reason that NXT kind of thrives the way it does. Yeah, in a way, potentially. Yeah, yeah. It, and you're right. And we, I, I'm trying to get back on like the Johnny Gargano, yeah, go ahead. goat time. I'm I can't think of a way to get back on it, so I'll just get back on it because of that. Actually, yeah, because of the writing that he's had, yeah, and I guess I believe he's given a little more freedom with his character, I guess. Yeah. He is able to make it his own, where a lot of guys on the main roster aren't, yeah. but that's why he can work it so well, because it basically is him. That's why Cena could work so well, because his character is basically John Cena. And also, he does it. I doubt that Cena takes what the writers give him and does it there's yeah, no honestly. way it, it's not the same, a chance it's punk never did it's punk the same never thing with did punk. owens never did jericho never did no. except jericho <clears throat> uh started working with jimmy jacobs yeah. and jimmy jacobs is a wrestling a wrestler yeah who came into wwe in a writing role okay, so yeah. jimmy so jericho was like i'm exclusively working with jimmy jacobs and no one else yeah so that's why jericho was able to do what he's doing because yeah. he had a dedicated writer <laughs> exactly where other people don't have dedicated writers and that's the thing. If if Johnny, if they, if they're able to let Johnny be Johnny on the main roster, and give him the right feuds, and he can keep going at this congruent pace that he's going at. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, at this but, pace. Yeah, at this pace that he's going at, I believe he will go down as the greatest of all time. He very well could. Um, <laughs> Cause this is the thing though that I was looking at. Cause wrestling is very different to any other sport. Yeah. And any other body of work, any media body of work. Yeah. With Johnny, if you look at his catalog of work and his catalog of matches in the WWE alone. You can match them up already to the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? 
Like, you can match them up to Sean's matches. You can match them up to Cena's matches. You can match them up to Austin, Rock, Brett, Angle, Taker. You can match them up. Yeah. Because that's the level of matches that he's putting on. However, though, I think this was... I don't know who... I. It was either a point that either you had or I had. I can't remember. But it was. it's a point that I've brought up in the past, though. And, but I think you might have brought it up recently when we were talking about it. Yeah. Let's say, uh, let's say it's a hockey player. Yeah. And in their first two seasons, they break every record in the league per season. Yep. Like they have the best season two seasons in a row. Yep. But then in the third season, <clears throat> they get some career-threatening injury and it ends their career. Yeah. Are they the greatest of all time? No. And it's 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 a debate. It is because some people are like, we'll be like. Well, he broke every record. Like, and again, he has to be the best to ever do it. But then it's like, did he really do it though? It's like he didn't do it for the length of career that these other guys did it. Yeah. It. it and again, I think it comes down to that. It's like he may have had the best season of all time. Yeah. He may have had the two best seasons of all he time, may, but he's not the best player of all time yeah, because exactly. of. We, because the circumstance, and that's the thing. Because as especially with other sports, as time goes on, it really becomes about your skill compared to other people's skill, and it differs a little bit in wrestling because it is about the skill you can still do in the ring uh-huh. on the mic, yeah, and your workload as well, your yeah. work rate to it, uh-huh. and and that's how it gets done. But with other sports, if you have a, an amazing two rookie seasons, but the next season, let's say it's not as good and it's overshadowed by this other rookie you came up, but he, he's not breaking the records that you broke, but his rookie season, he had a better season than you did in your third season. Yeah. Then it's hard for you to be looked at as the greatest of all time because you're not even the greatest of that season now. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I I feel like though that Johnny, because because when as we're talking about seasons and stuff, yeah. I honestly feel that twenty eighteen, no twenty seventeen, Johnny's twenty seventeen, hell twenty sixteen, I'll yeah let's go there. Hell, Johnny's entire NXT run, yeah, I feel is the best run, run of any superstar in history. Okay, yeah. Like, run as in, like, little mini chapter of their career. Their chapter yeah. of their career. This is the best chapter of any superstar's career ever to me. Yeah. It's like this, Sean's final year, where the storytelling that Sean told in his final year, you know? Yeah. Where he's, like, losing his mind. He's and that, losing that his feud mind. With, that, the feud with Taker. To that, beat the streak. That, I think, is up there. I think Jericho... Uh, <laughs> 2017 2018 is up there. Yeah. I think Jericho 2008 is up there. Austin 97 to 2001 is probably the best one ever. Mm-hmm. Uh The Rock uh 99 to 2003 like those are runs, right? Yeah. I honestly feel like Johnny Johnny's run in NXT has to be Top three, top five ever. Yeah. And and that's the thing about it, too, because this, what he's doing, that's all it is. It's not his career. It's a run. It's just a run. Yeah. And that's the thing. And the shitty thing is, if he does get a career-threatening injury, you're going to have to look at this only run as his career. And that's why it's going to, you can't really say he's the greatest of all time because he only had one run. Exactly. While you got guys like Michaels, Taker, Flair, Cena. like look at Jericho. I just mentioned two Jericho. different runs of exactly. like and excellence. He's had, they've all had multiple runs of excellence. Exactly. Yeah. And this is one run from Johnny. <clears throat> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a really good point to put a cap on it because I agree with you now fully. Yeah. That he, you kind of need, uh, what? What? Sorry, I'll answer this in a second. <laughs> but uh, what was I saying? Um. Uh, shit! This threw me off. Uh, I think he's referring to you. Anyways, uh, anyways, we're gonna be wrapping this up here. Yeah. So, 
Uh, what was I saying? Okay, the run. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you because uh, Johnny is fully like in just a run right now. It's yeah. not a career. Def- it's not a whole career. This could be a career defining run. We may look it back at Johnny Gargano and be like, that was the run. That but was his the whole best career run. needs more runs. Exactly. Yeah. That's the perfect way of putting it. Yeah. And I think that that's where we'll leave it for now. This is part one of this podcast series. Yeah. So uh, we'll have to come back and do an actual. I think we'll do. I think we'll do a part two for WrestleMania, and we can we, get way into that because yeah, there's might, eight hours of a fucking show to go since through. Since we did a whole podcast, not even touching WrestleMania, we might as well get into WrestleMania in the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll do a part two to this podcast uh, later this week. It yes. might even come out tomorrow, or the day after, maybe. Yeah. Cause yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Yep. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Yeah. And that's tomorrow. <laughs> that's it for tonight. I am Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. Have a good evening. So tomorrow, bullshit. T- tomorrow we'll do uh, the WrestleMania podcast. Yeah. 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 All right. So I think with that being said, we don't really have too much else to talk about. Thank you, Dixon, for being here. Do you want to plug your social medias for the kind people before we leave? You know it. You've heard it. You know how to hear it, and you're hearing to know it. Here we go. Dixon Tar five hundred nine on Instagram. DST509 on Twitter. Doc, the doctor, not full word doctor, T H E capital D R 300, the number on YouTube. You'll find some cringe ass videos of me when I was a kid. Um, and then the most important part, and I urge you this. This is very important. You need to listen to me. My life depends on it. Your life depends on it. If you see me on Tinder, swipe up. Swipe up for the boy. Swipe up for the sky. (laughs) All right. I'll give you my socials now. Um, Instagram at Yasinelahe, Y-A-S-I-N-E-L-A-H-E-E. Um... Same thing goes for Apple Music, Spotify, uh, Tidal, SoundCloud, YouTube, fucking everything. Just Yasin Elihi. Two words, one name, second name. Yasin Elihi. All those. Find my music. Buy a dark birthday. Stream it endlessly so I can become a millionaire by the end of the year. And then I could have at least like ten thousand of no, those dollars. What? Oh, what? No, what? No, what? What? Why would you get that? For being your friend. That doesn't... I don't pay for friends. Oh, okay. You guys don't hear from Dixon ever again? <laughs> He's like, you don't? You, you what don't, the fuck? All right, cut, it, cut, cut the podcast. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? What, what the fuck, Tyler? You, you, said, you said I was going to be paid for this. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that being said, do you have any uh, last remarks to say to the people? Um, Like, subscribe... You know, please actually subscribe and like the videos. We're right and comment and comment, like, comment, share, subscribe to all these fucking podcasts. We've only gotten one comment in all of our hand videos. the hand shout out hand That's the hand because please, if you're listening, please just do one like do one of these things so we know you're listening. Yeah, because just seeing views just means somebody clicks on it, listens five seconds. Oh, not my thing. Then leaves. It could be that, or it, it could, could be, be that, or it could be people watching fully. We don't. And know. if you're watching fully, at least like comment. And if, you're, and if you're not watching fully, dislike it and tell us what the fuck you don't like yeah, about exactly. it, and we'll fix it. And even, but if you watch it fully, at least just comment below a number, a letter, just any fucking thing. Yeah, just just comment anything. Just anything. Anything. Shout out hand the hand. And shout out to Snickers, by the way. <laughs> Honestly, comment faggot if if you're brave enough. <laughs> if you're brave enough, comment faggot. I don't think YouTube allows you to do that. Ah, shit. I think it gets blocked. F star 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 I T. What? Oh, there are two G's. I was trying to think, is there two G's or one G? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, finally, subscribe to the channel Yasin Elihi or yes. Mr. Stop and Watch. It's the same thing. One of them is just the name that's on it, and Mr. Stop and Watch is the actual channel name. Subscribe there. We got some good 
good videos coming out. They're trying to they're for the most part um, music reaction type things. But we have more stuff other than that. We have vlogs that are that'll be eventually coming out again. Yeah, more contents on the way. Just we have a lot of shit that we're planning on doing at this point. Yeah. So uh, Dixon also has some uh, projects of his own that we're starting to think up. Yeah. So uh, everybody go subscribe over there. Uh, thank you all for watching. Shout out to Snickers and Wig Women Pop.